Okay, friends, uh, good morning and welcome back. We are in the course of beginning of human life bioethics, ethical issues at the beginning of human life within the program of the Master of Science in Bioethics. Beginning always with a little prayer in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of the faithful and enkindle in us the fire of your divine love. We pray in a special way today for uh, the people of the world with the coronavirus, which is apparently extremely virulent, that uh, through your inspiration of the scientific community, we may be able to come up with a vaccine. And in the meantime, for those who have been exposed, infected, uh, or vectors, have mercy on them according to your divine will, place your healing and upon them and for the rest of humanity that again we may be uh, safe we pray this in the name of christ our lord amen <coughs> not a week go by, goes by and sometimes not a day goes by without a new bioethical issue on the horizon right and sometimes we have to move quickly on these issues Quarantine, for example, now entire nations are closing their borders to China, to any Chinese. And uh, the whole country of China, which is huge, has about one fifth of the world's population, is kind of on lockdown right now. So it's been said before that uh, many times bioethics is playing catch up because <laughs> the ethical issues arrive, or the, the biological issues arrive, or the technology becomes available too fast to have done the ethical analysis. Uh, one typical case was uh, in vitro fertilization, which I don't think we'll have time to cover this time. We'll cover it uh, in our next session. But these issues come up so fast because of developing technology that it really doesn't allow time for the reflection that needs to go on in the bioethical community as to whether we should or not, right? So it's forever that quandary, we can do it, but may we do it, it's a different question. The challenge is, I can tell you forever in bioethics, that once the genie is out of the bag, right? Once CRISPR is out there, then who's going to put uh, the reins and the strain on these technologies, which are promising scientifically, economically, socially, and of course, if there's economics, there's gonna be politics in it too, right? So that makes the bioethical issues really complicated. Trying to present the best possible arguments, that's why we really don't depend much on religious arguments as such, but rather on what we know as natural law. In other words, nature teaches us. Nature has a certain mode of behaving, right? There's an infection process, for example, there's a lithic phase and there's a lysogenic phase, which it doesn't matter if it is the Pope, President Trump, or the poorest person in Bangladesh who's getting infected, they're all going to go through that same cycle. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we allow nature to tell us. Part of the nature telling us is what we call, what I've uh, addressed before, form follows function. In other words, the shape, the structure of a thing is according to its function, all right? Uh, that function then should be respected. This will become relevant uh, again when we talk about, uh, for example, natural family planning. These next three topics actually, uh, today contraception, then we'll look at in vitro fertilization, and then we'll look at natural family planning. And there, this you'll see how this principle of form follows function applies very well. In other words, the, the structure of the organs and the function of the organs have an intrinsic dignity to them that should be respected, all right? We can assist these organs, but when we start substituting them or replacing them, then we have crossed that boundary into an area where ethically we say we are working against the function of those organs. And therefore, we're working against the function of the organism as a whole, of the individual of the person. 
we'll get there. That was kind of a little bottom line synopsis of uh, what we'll cover in more detail. Before I do that, let me stop for a moment. Now that you have your homework back, uh, sorry, didn't get any time to correct the location here. <laughs> so, any questions or comments? We already broke. We went into the first controversial issue, which is uh, abortion. To this day, fifty years after, almost fifty years after its legalization continues to be extremely controversial and polarizing our society. So let me stop for a moment and see if there are any other comments or questions on the topic. Shavan? Um, in my paper, I asked a couple of things. You, um, if I, mm -hmm. because I was, you know, I had to listen to the lecture. Yes. Um, there's, there's a couple of things in the way you may have presented it that I, I think Session to sure. um, um, some of the factual things you said there were only 1,000 illegal back alley abortions a year before Roe. And I was no. wondering where you got that figure. I, I don't think I said actually 1,000. Uh, if I did, I, um, I meant a few thousand, but that's just what was being said anecdotally okay. at the time. All right, it was a few thousand. If I may elaborate on that, you know. Uh, one back alley abortion was one too many. So uh, just by the numbers, uh, what I was trying to do by that is to say that once abortion became legal, the order of magnitude increased several fold, all right, from a few thousand to over a million. Well, mm. I, I don't know that I can dispute that. Right. But if you don't have accurate figures as to how many abortions back alley illegal what happened right. that are being done, I don't yeah. know that you can say that. I mean, probably. I mean, it, it probably does follow logically that if it became legal, then more women would avail themselves to the procedure. But yes, it, it, it's, it's a couple of things. Mm -hmm. um, you talked about. Uh, legal judges or judges are being sort of bullied by radical feminists. At the time, at the time, uh, again, it was the 70s, and we remember all the social revolt that was going on, right? And it was perceived as like a banner for women's liberation at the time, to, to have this right of their own body, even if they're pregnant, it was perceived as the ultimate, mm, let's say, frontier of liberation. Well, I'm not sure that history is entirely accurate. I mean, there is some, some idea that, yes, yeah, social revolution and women's rights along with, you know, gay rights, civil liberties, etc. Right. But when you talked about the radical feminists, I was actually reading up a little bit about Sarah Whittington, who actually argued her way. way. Um, she was, she actually had an illegal abortion in Mexico. Um, and that may be one reason she actually wanted to overturn the law. So it doesn't mm -hmm. necessarily make her or others who were looking at it as radical feminists. I mean, my mother is a practicing Catholic, went to a Catholic nursing school up in St. Vincent's, actually worked at St. Vincent's in New York. And my mom is pro-choice. And so back then, I mean, I don't think you would have ever called my mom a radical feminist. Um, I may be more of a radical <laughs> feminist, but so the, the idea is it's somewhat pejorative. I, I just don't see that women who want to exercise authority over their body and want to have the responsibility and the moral agency to do that should be sort of, which I do think you're using it as a pejorative, a radical feminist. All right. Well. Yeah. Sure, I guess on that point, we're going to disagree with all due respect, uh, but we know for a fact, historically, that some people in society radicalize, okay? In fact, that is a sociological term that is used um, not necessarily with an ethical value attached to it, but it is used, for example, there are billions of Muslims in the world but not all Muslims are radical. Some Muslims radicalize and they tend to become extremely violent. 
and that's a social phenomenon that is studied by sociologists, all right? So the radicalization in many different aspects of society, many different aspects of, of our value system, if you will. And that is a term that is out there. I mean, I didn't invent the term. No, no I understand it. But Media it, uses it. You know. it, it, is, it is essentially a pejorative when you use it in the sense of radical feminist, radical Muslim, um, you right. know, so the, it's the radical portion of it, but yes. I, I just want to put out there that perhaps, like in any other um, the, the phrase that comes to my mind, mm -hmm. one person's terrorist is another person's freedom fighter. So depending on where you are on an issue, you may not see it as terribly radical to want to be, but I, I take your point on sure. the, the social oh. unrest and Let's look at 9-11. I'm sure that from Bin Laden's position, he would have said, well, we killed a few hundreds, maybe a few thousand Americans, but uh, you Americans have killed millions of children in their mother's womb. So who has killed more people here? Who has killed more innocent people? And Bin Laden has a very legitimate claim about that, you know, because we have killed more innocent people than the radical Muslims have. Or radical, or radical terrorists, let's say, you know, whether they're Muslim or not. Oh, no, 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 I actually have that as, you know, I just heard you bars that had, you know, signs up for Torah and, and gave them money and, and still, you know, the IRA and stuff like that. So, I mean, I understand very, very well, I yeah. say very well, but I do understand depending on where you are on an issue. Um, so I think that, but at some point, you know, we can straddle the fence back and forth and say, one person's uh, uh, terrorist is another person's freedom fighter. At some point, we have to look at the issue. The issue itself, by itself, standing on its own ground, is it a legitimate issue or not? You know, do we have a legitimate government or do we have a dictatorship? Do we have a tyranny, right? So at some point, we have to uh, take a stand on the issue itself, regardless of other people's opinion. Apparently, the majority of the people in Jerusalem were swayed to consider Jesus Christ a radical and a threat to their stability. And also they were pushed to yell, crucify him. And the vast majority, at least according to the narrative that we have access to, did yell out, crucify him. That, I think that we can say, was an unjust cry, all right? It was illegitimate. It challenged them. It challenged them radically <laughs> to their complacency. Mm -hmm. So that being the radical is not necessarily a pejorative. Exactly. Okay. In fact, I would say Jesus Christ was the most radical human being because he liberated us from sin, which is the most radical enslavement of the human. And then there's two other things. Um, mm -hmm. I think you have on a few occasions spoken yeah. somewhat dismissively of um, Planned Parenthood. Um, yes, and not dismissively enough, if I may say. <laughs> okay, well, I strongly disagree with you. you know, I'm sure. For healthcare and things like that. Sure. Um, you know, Margaret Sanger, I mean, I, I think it would follow when you sort of think of contraception as being a forerunner to abortion, but really did try to do something about the lives of women who were having an incredible number of children who died in children from sepsis. Yes. So, and, just even not remembering her name, which I'm sure was just couldn't, you know, bring it to the forefront during the lecture. Um, but she really did do an important job for women, and Planned Parenthood does do important work in communities. And I don't think they hide. I, I think the uh, genesis slur is is, is, not, is just not quite fair to to sort of encompass her life. Um, you know, you can think of the Bucks decision in the Supreme Court where, you know, Justice Holmes said, you know, one generation of, of imbeciles and idiots is enough. But we don't think of him as being in Genesis. So I think there's a totality. Maybe he was. <laughs> I don't well, know enough about I'm his life. I'm not saying he wasn't, and I'm not even saying mm -hmm. I agree, but there is a context yes. to what people believe. And, and exactly. as a scientist, know this as we learn more, we grow and we change. So, um, and beliefs that were common. So I, I just, yes. I, I think your dismissal of Planned Parenthood is somewhat, un, 
there and um, I'll just leave it at that. Sure, absolutely. Excellent. That is actually a beautiful segue into today's lecture because I will be talking about contraception, okay, <laughs> going from one bombshell to another. And I'm going to start precisely with a brief, very brief history of the pill uh, being by far the most um, widely used contraceptive uh, today and precisely focusing on the life of Margaret Sandra, okay, even though if it is sketchy, all right, but that is exactly what we're beginning with. In fact, uh, I had this uh, brief history of the pill at the end of the lecture, kind of in the second half, but I decided to move it up because it makes more sense to do the history first and then land where we are today. So actually the first half of the lecture is dedicated to this brief history, just to bring everyone on board because I've noticed in my dialogues with people over decades, Many people are not aware of the history of the pill in the United States, how it developed uh, precisely uh, with the FDA being approved as a drug, as a medication, all right? Okay, so uh, here we go. It's, uh, this video is on, video, yes, thank you very much. There's the little dot. Okay, so we go forward. Which, since I'm recording, might as well cover a couple of things. For the record, <laughs> yes, February 8th, a week from today, we still have a lecture. But then February 15th, I'm going to be out of town. And the weekend after that also, okay? Anyway, the, the following Saturday, we're still on. And also I want to mention that uh, I've been <clears throat> kind of lenient. Some of you have been late in homeworks and I've been kind of lenient on that uh, to give you time to adjust and, and, and get into kind of a rhythm here. But really the, uh, the homework is due by midnight of Wednesday, all right? And in fairness to the people who struggle to do that and get it in, right under the wire sometimes at 11.59 <laughs> on Tuesday night on, on Wednesday. Um, you can still turn it in late, but I'm gonna start deducting a few points. Oh, you mean Tuesday night, 11.59? No, no, Wednesday, Wednesday night, night, Wednesday night, 11.59. Yes, okay. Wednesday night, Wednesday night, okay. So that gives me at least Thursday and Friday to correct it or to go over, all right? But Wednesday night, Wednesday midnight. So having said that, uh, after that deadline, I'm gonna start de deducting three to five uh, points per day, <laughs> all right, on 100 points, so that uh, just a little added incentive and in fairness to the ones who do the struggle to get it in on time. All right, now, <clears throat> the most immediate antecedent to the legalization of the pill in the United States that I can think of is precisely uh, the President Margaret Sanger. Okay. So I want to go a little bit over her uh, life and her struggle. She was born at the end of the 19th century, toward the end of the 19th century, and lived up until 1966, uh, so almost uh, 90 years. And she was the daughter of um, Irish immigrants. The context of immigration in the United States in the 18th and 19th century was very uh, challenging struggle, to say the least, because most of the European um, immigrants were coming in from mostly Ireland, Germany, and Italy. Many of them happened to be Catholic, and there was sadly uh, horrible discrimination against Catholics going on in the United States at the time. Uh, in general, by the Protestant community, uh, the acronym WASP is for a reason. Let me start up a few notes here just for the spelling. So, WASP stands for uh, white. Anglo-Saxon Protestant. Protestant, 
Anglo-Saxon DS is a Saxon <laughs> privacy. So what happened basically is that the religious slash political slash social fights and struggles that were going on in Europe spilled over with the colonization of uh, America, specifically North America and the original 13 colonies and so forth. So Great Britain getting a foothold first in the US in what is today the US North American territory and precisely is seeking as part of that uh, voyage freedom from an official religion of Anglicanism, right? Which to this day, the head of uh, the Anglican Church in Great Britain is the Queen, right? Who is also the head of government, at least symbolically. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was the first uh, foothold and these um, mostly Protestants who came over, uh, but also free thinkers and uh, people who didn't have any particular religious belief wanted freedom of religion to the point that it became enshrined in the constitution, all right? And separation of church and state, not to protect the state from the church, but to protect the church from the state, all right? So that the state would not impose a religion, an official religion. Uh, which also has a lot to say about the National Cathedral. I don't know if you've ever been to the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. Anyone ever been there? Beautiful, gorgeous. No, I mean the National Cathedral, which is, yes. National Cathedral is um, a Gothic church in Washington, D.C., which is up on a hill and can be seen by many viewpoints and it is Anglican. Okay. Look at that. It is a replica of a Gothic cathedral in medieval Europe. Uh, I don't know exactly which replica it is. Uh, it's not Notre Dame, maybe one of the British uh, cathedrals. Before the Reformation, so all these were Catholic uh, churches uh, back then before the Reformation, all right? But it's named that way, perhaps in an effort to establish uh, uh, Anglicanism, or actually the, the American branch of Anglicanism is Presbyterian, okay? And, uh, but the National Cathedral is only national by name. <laughs> This is not the Cathedral of the United States of America, okay? It's just named that way because they wanted to name it that, that way. The Immaculate Conception, which is the Catholic Church in Washington, first of all, it, um, is not a cathedral, it's actually a basilica dedicated to our Blessed Mother. Here it is, and it's in a Romanesque style, which predates the Gothic. <laughs> Lower Middle Ages, Middle Middle Ages, basically the Byzantine era, I don't know if you've ever been there, again, gorgeous, huge, humongous. Uh, uh, anyway, that's National Cathedral, that is the Immaculate Conception National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception, a basilica. It is not the Cathedral of Washington, D.C. The Cathedral of Washington, D.C. is St. Matthew's Cathedral, downtown DC, which is a very moderate church. Um, so anyway, I bring this up because uh, this may have been some kind of an effort to establish <laughs> Anglicanism or the American branch uh, of the Presbyterians as a national religion, but it's not, all right? So uh, Luis? What makes Cathedral is the seat of the bishop. So there is a canonical determination to that. For example, St. Mary's Cathedral here in Miami is the church of the bishop, where the cathedra is. The cathedra is the chair. And the chair represents the authority of uh, the bishop by delegation of the pope. And it also represents the teaching office. So many universities in Europe in the Middle Ages 
came out of cathedrals. They were literally attached. It was the building adjacent to the cathedral, like for example, uh, in uh, Paris and uh, Bologna and many of the medieval cities of Europe. The cathedral represented is where the cathedra was and is to this day, and the cathedra is a reference to the chair. The chair represents the authority of whoever sits on that chair, which is the bishop. In the case of the archdiocese, would be an archbishop. All right. So basically, it's a, it's a it's a reference to the authority by way of teaching. In other words, by way of the truth. Taking from the saying of Jesus, only the truth will set us free. All right. And so we are always seeking the truth. But Jesus has already told us, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So we landed on Christ and his actions and his consequences, specifically when he establishes the church, the church as one church, upon Peter the rock. Upon this rock, I will build my church. All right, so that passage we interpret uh, as the saying of Christ. And that's where we get the tradition of the cathedra. So the cathedral is the building that houses that church, that authority, which is based on uh, seeking the truth that uh, Christ gives us. So it's also an evangelization effort, right? To teach and to promote the truth and so forth. Back to Margaret. So the 18th and 19th centuries were very difficult for Catholic immigrants. In fact, there is a, uh, John Neumann, who is not John Henry Newman, not Cardinal Newman. There are two John Neumanns uh, who are saints in the Catholic Church. One is uh, John Henry Ca Cardinal Newman. With one N, who was an Anglican bishop who converted to Catholicism and eventually uh, is a teacher, as a doctor of the church. He converted from Anglican Catholicism to uh, Catholicism, and he was British, all right? This is John Henry Newman. The Newman Centers are named after him for evangelization of university students, right? Different from another John Newman, but it's pronounced Neumann because he is German. <laughs> First of all, he's German, not uh, British. Secondly, he's got two N's on his last name, make him German. And he was Catholic from birth, <laughs> even though he was in Germany. Uh, and he came to the U. Uh, instead of uh, yeah. U, instead of W. All right, thank you. Yeah. Right, right, instead of W. And it's the British one who just Yes, right. Yes. The both saints. But recently, I mean, but recently yes. Uh, John Henry Newman. Let's try that. John Henry Newman was um, Anglican and converted, was blessed and was canonized. Here is uh, John Neumann, who was German and became the Bishop of Philadelphia. And the pressure of the Know Nothings, the Know Nothings was a Protestant group that basically was in charge of um, persecuting uh, Catholics and even killing Catholics. And then when they were interrogated or questioned, they would say, oh, I know nothing, I know nothing, I, I didn't see anything, I know nothing. So there's a social movement and you can look it up. They were called the Know Nothings, okay? The pressure on new on Neumann was so strong that he eventually had a heart attack in the middle of the street and collapsed and died in uh, Philadelphia. He was, he was associated with Catherine Drexel, St. Catherine Drexel, which also founded uh, Catholic schools, and Drexel University named after her and so forth. So they were involved in the uh, promotion of Catholic education as an alternative to public education because in public education, the public education system in the United States was founded in part to teach the children how to read and write and how to read the Bible, okay, by Protestants. So that is the origin of the public school system in the United States, 
one of the efforts was to teach the children how to read the Bible specifically. And of course, a Protestant interpretation of that, sola scriptura and so forth. So what Newman and Drexel and um, the other one from, um, uh, from New York and then Cabrini. Colorado, Cabrini, Mother Cabrini, and all of these who were involved in Catholic education one and two and three centuries ago, really wanted to get the tradition of Christianity in together with the Bible. So, so there would, wouldn't be sola scriptura, but we would be scripture and tradition, right? In other words, a 2000 year tradition that we have uh, in Christianity, um, which could include all of the teachings of the Catholic Church. All right, so that's a little bit of background to uh, her milieu uh, the, in the United States as a whole. And in New York, of course, so Ellis Island, we know all, all the immigrants that went through there, all the injustice and prejudice and discrimination that went in there. Catholics, uh, many places had signs, blacks and Catholics need not apply. I mean, this is all historical, it's there. You probably know American history much better than I do, uh, but it's there, okay? There's also Irish being not applied. Specifically. And so what did they have left? Bless you. Uh, and the origin of the Knights of Columbus and all this for precisely for, uh, uh, by, um, uh, what's his name, that founded the Knights, uh, who's up for verification also now, um, to protect widows uh, of, uh, of Irish um, men because the few jobs that were available were horrible jobs, mostly in the mines, especially in the Northeast, in Pennsylvania, that whole area was in the mines, coal mines. So most of these men would die young from black, black lung, all right? Because no one wanted to do those jobs, so that was the only thing that was available to them. Many, many died that way. Um, uh, McGivney, Father McGivney, it comes eventually, <laughs> I'm sorry. It's, uh, it's already setting in. All right, so Margaret grew up in that milieu. And she was the 11th out of, uh, she was the sixth, I'm sorry, out of 11 siblings that survived. Her mom actually had 18 pregnancies, all right? So the father of Margaret was extremely abusive of the mother, essentially getting her pregnant all the time. And that same barefoot, pregnant, and in the kitchen, they lived it, all right? Probably, maybe at her last childbirth, I don't know. Not, no. not, not her last child, okay. But yeah, but a premature death because of the hardship that she had to live with. And in fact, Margaret at a young age had to take care of her other siblings because the mother was just too, too, too feeble, all right? And the father was uh, a disaster, essentially. And that was a lot of what women live at that time. And she lived that. She grew up with that abuse, that women were constantly getting pregnant, even beyond their will, you know, there was no consent, even if they were married and all this. It was the expectation of the time that the primary purpose, even within the Catholic Church, and the church has to own up to that, that the primary purpose of marriage was for procreation. And the secondary purpose, like I, as a side effect, was the intimacy of the couple itself. But don't you dare enjoy it because, and there was this misconception in the Catholic Church that somehow sex, sexual intimacy was wrong, was evil, was bad, because if it was so pleasurable, how could it be good, right? It was that mentality, and I can tell you, Today, that is a heresy that is called Jansenism, that filtered into our church, precisely coming from, <laughs> from Protestantism. But Jansenism, Jansenius, was that uh, the body was intrinsically evil. And it was, for example, like the Calvinist uh, perception that the body was intrinsically evil after the fall, of course, with Adam and Eve, and therefore grace had to cover the evil of the body, like snow covers a, a heap of dung, all right, of manure. That was kind of Calvin's expression, that the, the, the body was intrinsically evil after the fall, and God's grace covered 
our evilness, you know, and made us good that way. And that also gets into the whole doctrine of predestination and so forth, which is way too complicated and irrelevant at this point. So I'm going far afield just to let you know the perception of the time that the husband of, um, of the father of Margaret, whose name I don't even remember, uh, was very abusive and was typical of the time within the Catholic milieu and within the Protestant milieu in many cases also. That women were essentially for reproduction and it was to validate the sexual intercourse. Even the marital rights, right? They talk about marital rights. I mean, that's it. Casti Canubi was the last encyclical uh, that touches on, on, uh, on marriage before the Second Vatican Council. Casti Canubi of chaste spouse mentions marital rights, mentions the primary purpose of marriage. Marital rights was the right to have intercourse. And of course, it applied to both the husband and the wife. But who do you think used that right <laughs> mostly? The husband, not the wife. The wife hoped that she would have a right to say no, but she didn't, at least in the official documents of the church. Okay, and that was the milieu in which these people were growing and living generation after, after generation. Very sad, very real. Uh, yeah, yeah. Excuse me, yeah. the primary purpose of marriage mm -hmm. yeah. uh, was procreation. I, I saw four of you, it was one of the highest I don't know which one. I, maybe. What was uh, Casti Canubi? I think no, no, this, it, when I was looking at some of the things. Yes. Uh, but it, it is actually the, the Pope. Like I said, I know it's one of the biases. I should have looked at the Pope. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Casti Canubi is the encyclical. I oh, think. Oh, that was a 500. Casti Canubi? Casti Canubi. Oh. Chaste spouses. There we go. Uh, was it? Uh, well, it was 1930s. Uh, Pius XI, yes, Pius XI. All right, there he is. The 11th. The 11th. There were 12 Piuses. Uh, so Pius XI. Which is the one that took the children? There's the argument that it's the 12th. Yes. He, the 12, part of the 12 with the uh, Nazis. Yes. What's spouses are supposed to be chased. Exactly. Let me get it right. No. They were being raised by their fathers who, so they just yeah. learned. Right. Generation yeah. after generation is passed on as uh, by perception and by social standards. All right. Um, let me just uh, save this for a moment. Yes. So uh, that is a social milieu. Right. And that comes from. Part, a, a particular interpretation of scripture. It also comes from the Jewish tradition of placing emphasis on the heritage, right? And the patriarchy that they lived and so forth. Let me just land this for a moment into the proper. Okay. So, um, that was the last encyclical. before the Second Vatican Council. And it was also based on a defective biology, unfortunately, and a defective anthropology, right? And so forth. So the church has been long in coming up to speed and precisely that's why it precipitated the Second Vatican Council. And then consider if there was a Second Vatican Council, then there was a First Vatican Council, right? First Vatican Council was in 1869 or 68, uh, almost 100 years before Vatican II. Vatican II was 1962 to 65, 1962 to 65, all right? So almost 100 years had passed. And in those 100 years, so much social unrest and social movements had occurred that the church really needed to update, like 
uh, Saint uh, John the Twenty Third said, "Aggiornamento and updating, bringing the Church up to date." So the first encyclical immediately after the Council, the Second Vatican Council, was what uh, uh, Pope uh, Paul the Sixth, um, "Bless you, Humane Vitae, Humane Vitae," right? And talks about "Bless you." Talks about the two dimensions of human sexual intercourse, the two dimensions of the marital act, of the conjugal act the procreative and the, in, and the unitive dimension together, all right? And this thing of marital rights, as if, you know, the husband had a right to the, to the wife's body just to believe himself was anthropologically defective and also physically and theologically defective. So we move from there, all right? That, in my opinion, is one of the clearest case of development of doctrine that we say in theology. When we see that the church is coming up to date with a better anthropology, not just a different anthropology, but a better anthropology, so a better it view. Does it, it doesn't more? contradict it, it brings it up to date, all right? Because no encyclical can contradict each other, at least on doctrinal issues. Yes. Precisely, the only statement that really came out of Vatican I, because the bishops had to flee, they had just gathered in Rome, 1869, about 300 bishops more or less, uh, and Garibaldi was coming down the Italian peninsula, unifying the Italian state, right? Which meant that uh, essentially he was conquering and taking over the papal states and the papal territories that were Extramuri were outside of the Vatican. The papacy at that time, throughout the Middle Ages and into the Renaissance, uh, practically owned half of the peninsula, of the Italian peninsula, and the other half were, were just independent states, like the Republic of Venice and Milan and, uh, and um, Florence and Nap Naples. They were kingdoms and they were independent uh, kingdoms that were fighting each other and so forth. So when Garibaldi begins this move in the uh, 19th century to unify the Italian peninsula into one state, you know, he comes into Rome and the Pope, I forget who the Pope was at the time, he flees through a <coughs> corridor on the second story, if you've ever been to Rome, from St. Peter's into Castel Gandolfo, the circular medieval um, castle, locks himself in, and declares himself a prisoner of the state, officially. <laughs> All right. <laughs> he was fleeing for his life. <laughs> and it wasn't until the abdication of the Italian monarchy, officially with uh, um, uh, Umberto II de Savoia, the second, uh, Umberto II of, of the House of Savoia, which was the royal house of Italy at the time, he abdicates in favor of the Republic that the Pope comes out of Castel Gandolfo symbolically, you know, into freedom <laughs> because he declares himself to save his life, a prisoner of the state. Anyway, what the bishops did, they fled. They fled Vatican I and never even concluded. So a hundred years later, when Vatican II convenes, the first official act of Vatican II was to close Vatican I. Because <laughs> they never had, canonically, they never had the opportunity to close it. They just fled for their lives. <laughs> so that was the first official thing that the Vatican II did. So Vatican I was the shortest council and the longest council. <laughs> Sorry? And that's what came out of Vatican I, was people infallibility. In matters of faith and morals, which includes human intercourse, uh, uh, the church, the Pope is infallible. The Pope cannot err because he has the direct communication with the Holy Spirit and the direct inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But That's a doctrine of the church. Done that doctrine twice? Is it the, the Pope's infallibility, the virginity of Mary, and the immaculate conception of Mary? And oh, it's how you're talking about. Uh, so we sometimes we have doctrines and sometimes we have dogmas. Yes. The, yes, we have official declarations of the church. There are very few, okay, those are it. But basically, these dogmas and doctrines, um, 
what they, for example, take the Immaculate Conception. Huh? It doesn't mean that Mary became Immaculate in 1952 when the document was published, okay? She was Immaculate from her conception, which is now when she conceived Jesus. It's her conception about a dozen years or 15 years prior to having Jesus. When she was conceived by Anna and Joachim, all right, in Anna's womb, she was conceived without original sin. It's a doctrine of faith. Again, a doctrine of faith, it's metaphysical. I cannot go in there and prove you that the zygote Mary had no sin, all right? Because there's no instrument on earth that can measure that. <laughs> so it's not empirical. It's metaphysical. It's a doctrine of faith. Father, so this is from, it's only been infallibility has only yeah. been cited three times, correctly. The Pope is infallible is one. That Mary was conceived with Without original sin, and well, those are official. Those are what we call dogmas of faith. All right. Yeah, but I know what she's talking about. And that it's only being invoked, yeah. guys. That uh, papal infallibility. But in terms of the magisterium, yeah. Okay. 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 I get it. Okay. 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 So there is ordinary teaching of the church, the magisterium, and there is extraordinary teaching of the church, right? So the ex cathedra are the extraordinary teachings of the church, all right? It meaning that it goes above and beyond what is the common belief of the people, which would be the ordinary teaching of the church, the magisterium. We're getting heavily into doctrinal theology, uh, and systematic theology, which is not part of this course, that's part of fundamental theology. We're now in applied moral theology and bioethics. <laughs> so we need to rein back in a little bit, but I'm just trying to kind of give you the background on the Protestant and on the Catholic side with regards to uh, how human sexual intercourse was interpreted and was abused, sadly, even citing you know, official teaching, or at least a perception of that official teaching. So Margaret grew up in that environment, and she kind of developed a resentment against the abuse of men on women, because everywhere she looked around, especially in the poor milieu, she just saw pregnant women, okay? And the men were walking around scot-free. Some of them were obviously responsible. Some of the men were responsible for the pregnancies and others were not responsible for the pregnancies, okay? And so women who were the Irish twins, right? You've heard of Irish twins? Yeah. Kind of sarcastically, what's an Irish twin? One, they're brothers or sisters who have less than 12 months apart, <laughs> all right? So that means that you know, as soon as she was able to tolerate, or even if she was not able to tolerate another uh, intercourse, she will get pregnant again, all right? Sorry? Exactly, right. And so, you know, now today, sometimes we say tongue in cheek, but at the time, people really had to live that tragedy, and it was a total abuse. So this cycle did not allow women to get an education, to get out of the home, to get out of the kitchen, because they had to be cooking all the time with all the children crying around them and so forth. And it was just exhausting. I mean, today, to have one or two children is exhausting for couples, all right? <laughs> so we've kind of gone to the other extreme now. Uh, there very seems very to be an allergy. Sorry? There was a very high infant mortality rate. Yes. My grandmother was one of 15 children. Really? Only Look at that. Of Look at that, half. Almost half, yes. It was, it was very common. Children were used to the death of their siblings, all right? There was ill health all over the place. There were still plagues around and so forth. Very ill conditions. And that's how she grew up in that environment. And therefore, it's not surprising that by age 20, she already became a nurse because uh, she wanted to do something for women and help in their disastrous conditions that were in, especially the immigrant women and the immigrant Irish, okay? So she becomes a nurse. Was the mother a nurse also, Siobhan? No. The mother was I a nurse. I don't think so. Uh, she died yeah. with 22 pregnancies, I think is what I saw, and um, died at 50 of tuberculosis. There you go, which again was very common at the time, all right? So this, uh, and disproportionately affecting women than men because of the, of the conditions at home, etc. 
All right. It happened that at that time also there was a social movement of uh, the women's right to vote, which obviously I fully support. Well, it may not be obvious to you, but I'm telling you I fully support. Of course, it's, it's ludicrous for, for uh, adult women not to vote, just like it's ludicrous today to sell black people in the market as if they were things. And yet that was a reality in the United States two centuries ago, and it actually took a civil war to grant freedom and to recognize Africans or recognize black people, even if they were born here, as humans and not slaves, as subjects and not sub objects, okay? So that's why I'm still hopeful about the on board. <laughs> that sometimes those veils will come off at some point in the future. Uh, but it's happened before. It happened to blacks, it happened to women. And so these liberation movements, as uh, social movements tend to go, Sometimes they swing from one extreme to the other, all right? And as Jesus said, you got the wheat growing with the wheat. So if you pull out the weeds, you're gonna kill the wheat. So let the two things grow to full maturity and then start separating and discriminating between them. Uh, so sadly, she also got involved in the eugenics movement, all right? And this was a spillover precisely from Nazi Germany, from the Third Reich, who had uh, as part of the national policy was the purification of the human race and it came down to the Aryan race. And so many people, not her only, but many other people in society. In fact, uh, was the center at um, Cold Spring Harbor, which today is a prestigious scientific center in the United States for research, right? Cold Spring Harbor also was part of the eugenics movement way back in the 20s and the 30s. And even James Watson, the co-discoverer of, of the DNA code and the DNA structure together with, with Crick, uh, made very strange statements that even after birth, the mother should be allowed to decide within the first week or not whether she should uh, let the baby live or die or kill the baby because it was her baby. And if it didn't come out the way she wanted, then she should have the right to essentially kill the baby. Mm -hmm. This is James Watson, he said very strange things. Uh, at any rate, back to the eugenics movement. And at that time, she got involved in that, all right? In other words, we can see that whether consciously or unconsciously, she felt into a utilitarian mentality, into a mentality where the me, the ends justified the means. The means that she was living, the ends that were, she was living so drastically wrong, she needed to change that, that any means were justified. And she truly sought for women to have absolute control of the reproductive cycle. Not just reasonable control, but absolute control of that cycle. So in her mind, in her young mind at the time, the only way that that could be done was through science and through some chemical that would suppress ovulation. All right, she knew enough that ovulation is what gets a woman pregnant or, and so forth. So the idea was to suppress ovulation because even if women didn't want to have intercourse, they were being forced, they were being raped into intercourse and getting pregnant. So that was kind of the background motivation for her to engage then uh, Pincus and Rock, Gregory Pincus and John Rock. Now, Pincus was at Harvard, and he was a biologist. He was working on hormones, all right? And he was studying uh, progestins, following, he was studying the, the female cycle of uh, progestins and how that had the influence precisely on cycling, which is uh, different from men and so forth. Rock, on the other hand, was uh, in Philadelphia, and he was an OBGYN who had a very successful fertility practice for couples who wanted to get pregnant who were having difficulty getting pregnant, okay? And so Rock was a practicing Catholic and he was a daily communicant. And when uh, Sanger engaged both of them, I guess they knew each other from Harvard, Pincus was to work on the chemical that would suppress ovulation and Rock would do the trials. 
in his clinic. Okay. Now, for those of you who still doubt that uh, Margaret fell into eugenics mentality, again, this is stuff that's on the web. We don't want word to go out. That we want to exterminate the Negro population. That was, those were her words. She was writing to the Gamble brothers from Procter and Gamble fame, all right, and soliciting funds for developing the pill. Margaret had many quotes and they're all online. You can look them up and so forth. We do not want word to go out that we want to exterminate the Negro population. And the minister is the man who can straighten out that idea if ever occurs to any, to any other more rebellious members. Okay. Anyway, She had other quotes that essentially boiled down to uh, black people and uh, other minorities did not have a right to reproduce because they did not have the ability or the way we all to raise those children and so forth. So it's truly a eugenics mentality, okay? And uh, so eventually they have to do the trials, but uh, Contraception as such was illegal in the United States back then, all right? It was illegal. And so they had to move the trials to first Puerto Rico and then Mexico, and eventually they ended up in California. Uh, but uh, what they did was the placebos that were developed. So Inovid, I believe, was uh, the original chemical that they were using. But the trials were not done I mean, the trials would not pass an IRB review today, okay, uh, on ethical issues. Because the women were not told that some women were being given placebos and others were given the pill, the actual pill. So we need the, the negative control, right? And so some women in the, in the sample had to be given placebos to test a statistical difference between the real thing the actual dosage of the pill and the placebo, which was essentially a sugar pill. But women were not told, they were just told that they were being given contraceptives. So obviously they had flocks of women who wanted this contraceptive because in their perception, the way it was advertised to them for free is that they could have intercourse and not get pregnant, all right? So women just flocked to these trials of course, it was illegal here in the United States, so they had to move them down to Puerto Rico. And many women were getting pregnant and were saying, what's going on here? The pill, I was told that the pill, this pill would not get me pregnant. Uh, so I went ahead freely having intercourse with my husband or my girlfriend, whoever it was, and here I am pregnant. Well, you were the placebo, <laughs> okay? So that's how they got their statistics. Eventually they moved it to Mexico, again with the same thing, and finally they got some censure to do it in Los Angeles, uh, but it was being pushed as a, a menstrual regulator, all right? So Sanger had a little um, brochure that she would publish, uh, again, I forget the name of it, but she had like a little newsletter that she would publish, and there it was, promoted and she actually told women, just tell uh, your doctor that you wanna use this as a menstrual regulator, that you're having uh, amenorrhea or that uh, you're irregular and uh, there's a lot of um, uh, pain and it's causing you a lot of distress and so that you need this to regulate uh, your cycle. And that's how they push it through FDA first in 57 it was approved as uh, a menstrual regulator, okay? 
which is actually what is known as off-label because the pill was designed for contraception. <laughs> and off-label means that it's a secondary effect, all right? What's a label, off-label that is very common today, and I take it every day, another pill. <laughs> exactly. Maybe aspirin, 81 milligrams. When Bayer was designing, Bayer, aspirin actually was a, a side product when Bayer was doing research during the Second World War, precisely, on some medications. Okay? And aspirin was a side product of some other medication that they were developing. And they realized that it's a uh, capillary uh, dilatory is a dilator. And so it, it uh, helps circulation and so forth. And baby aspirin, <laughs> okay? It's, but it's not the intention. It's not the intention. Aspirin, the original intention was for uh, uh, minimizing pain, right? It's a pain relief. Okay, so the off-label aspect was pushed as a menstrual regulator and the FDA approved it in 57. And finally, in 1960, there were so many millions of women that were demanding for the pill that the FDA approved it, all right? And the um, anti-contraception laws were either rescinded or abandoned and not enforced. 1965, the Supreme Court allows contraception. Yes, but it was approved by FDA. And then it had to, it was challenged and the it had to go challenged. through, yeah, the law was challenged and it had to go through the procedure. But already at, in 1960, I know this because then it spread to many other parts of the world. All right, once again, this whole mentality that whatever the US does is automatically good and we don't question it, we follow uh, suit. All right, and it just spread exponentially to the point that today contraception is truly uh, the most widely used contraception. I'm sorry, the pill is the most widely used contraception throughout the world. Pills developed in the United States and nowhere else at the time. Correct. Right. She was she was the pioneer. So again, to me, this is a classical example where her intentions were all good. Absolutely, the end was good in the sense that she wanted to help women uh, not get abused or at least uh, not have the drastic consequences of a child following the abuse because essentially what was going on was rape inside and outside of marriage, okay? Not everybody, of course. Uh, I'm generalizing here a lot. I'm sure there were many, many good and, and honest and decent uh, husbands out there, you know, and boyfriends, but there was a lot of abuse. All right, but the means, you see, that's the whole challenge. And that's when we do principle bioethics, we have to look at the means also. We can't just stay with the ends, because if it's just the ends, we have a universe of good ends. But if that is sufficient, then the means are going to be a mess, a royal mess, because it's going to come down to who can shout the loudest or has the most money or the most power to impose that end on the rest of us. And there's no recourse. So the means also need to be justified in themselves. And that's what we call principled ethics, as opposed to the utilitarian. It really comes down to that one. And we can think of many other examples that also follow that same analysis, whether it's utilitarian or it's going to be principled. Uh, like could a single woman get a pill? And today? No, at the time. Yeah. And could married, married women have to have a husband permission? I don't know. Ambrose Good question. Said, so? Single women could not get the pill. You have to be married. I see. And it's 67 there for Tyson staff, which allows single women to get the pill. I see. Okay, so at first, what, they had to present a marriage certificate or something? I, uh, when they went to the pharmacy? Okay. Uh, can I go back yeah. to what you were talking about, Sanger being in yes. Genesis? Yes. Um, if I'm reading the quote here, yeah. um, it is definitely a misconception that this is coming from rewiring it, so I, I can't quote it exactly, but um, it is definitely a misconception that single women could not get the pill. Right. 
context wasn't about hiding the true exterminary purpose, exterminatory purpose of the Negro project and black people. Rather, it was about elucidating the true purpose of the project, disseminating birth control in black communities in the South and training black doctors to work within their own community. Then I do the quote, and I can, I mean, I can read the whole thing. Sure. Um, it basically starts off, it seems to me, I guess we sang her, from my experience where I have been in North Carolina, Georgia, Tennessee, and Texas, and while the colored Negroes have great respect for white doctors, they can get closer to their own members more or less lay their cards on the table, which means their ignorance, superstitions, and doubts. They do not do this with the white people, and if we can train the Negro doctor at the clinic, he can go among them with enthusiasm and knowledge, which I believe will have far-reaching results among colored people. Um, this success will depend on personality and training by us. The minister's work is important. We do not want the word to go out that we want to exterminate the Negro population, and the minister is the man who can straighten out that idea of the error occurs any of their more rebellious members. She clarifies when she wrote to Dr. Campbell, um, there's a great danger that the Negro project will fail because we think it's a plan for, because they will think it's a plan for extermination. Um, and then it's a standard school quote in context as the exact opposite meaning that anti-choicers like to attribute to it. Um, she worked with, with uh, W.E. Du Bois. She also worked See, it's book is from. Uh, anyway, it, it, um, sure. it does not seem that it, I'm not saying she is an eugenicist. I'm just saying that that quote that you use seems to be taken out of context or has been used. I don't know more about it. So, like I said, right now I just got this from Rewire News. Right. I'm just looking at it. But um, the truth is right there. In other words, She's focusing on the Negro population in her own words. And it's not just that one quote, there are many quotes. But she herself was Irish Catholic, grew up among white folk in uh, New York. You know, but she's targeting an ethnicity that is totally disconnected from her own ethnicity, which is who, what motivated her to go into nursing and into helping women. So why isn't she pushing for the pill with the white folk? You see? Yes, but she targeted the Negro population. She and there are the quotes. She worked with leading black leaders across the country yes. to establish the Harlem Project and other places here. It says the Federation's Division of Negro Services National Advisory, which included prominent black leaders like Du Bois, Mary McClude, Beth Noon, E. Franklin Frazier, Walter White, and the Reverend Adam Clayton Powell later on helped to manage the Negro Project. And exactly. Basically. So there it is. I mean, it's self-evident. She's targeting the Negro population, uh, whereas there are other minorities at that time in the United States, which were as, uh, as uh, ill-served and as poor and as exploited as the Negroes. Okay? But she worked in those communities also. Yes. Yes. She worked in both. But why, so why then not e give at least equal time and equal opportunity She's targeting a particular I ethnicity. Think what she's saying in the letter, with all due respect, mm -hmm. is that it's true about anything. You listen to your own people. We listen to our own Catholics. Yeah. We listen to our own. So she was talking about the project, but I'm, I'm just saying, well, there seems to be some. So where is the where is the logical consistency in her argument where she's trying to enlist the black ministers to? manipulate their population because they'll oh. listen to the black minister, whereas she totally derides the Catholic hierarchy, right? I As opposed to trying to work. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's all over the place. She wants She's, to embrace the people that have moral authority. Exactly. In that community. Yeah. And that's it. But yeah, but he does, but she does that exclusively with the Negro population, knowing that the Negro population are a very spiritual folk and they tie in naturally uh, with their black ministers, okay? And she's totally opposite to that. She's totally antagonistic to the Catholic priest and hierarchy when it comes to her own Catholic roots and her own Catholic women who are being exploited. Absolutely. You know, even on TV interviews and everything, she challenged everything that was coming out of the magisterium and was calling the Catholic hierarchy 
the abusers of all this, and they say are the ones who were promoting the abuse of women and all that. So, so widespread held by many people. Hmm? Um, okay. Yes. All right. So where is where is the logical consistency in her argument? She is absolutely targeting the black population to this day, which Planned Parenthood was not the original. She founded another group that eventually became Planned Parenthood when it changed names. But to this day, it is in the minority populations of the U.S. I'm sorry, Marie? No, I've actually, like, seen people. Yes, yes. When I'm driving around, uh -huh. I've seen so many people. Like, there's quite a few Planned Parenthood in my community, but if I go to a community, you know, neighborhood, I would see it. Yeah. Right? And there's, like, so see? that's my thought on it. Like, it is. It's a mandate. It's, it's a... I was there. I can't tell you. I don't know if there is. Background, yes. Right. Well, what I see mm -hmm. now, I kind of to this day, they've maintained that, uh, and Planned Parenthood is only part. It's actually a global organization that is called IPPF, International Planned Parenthood Federation. So this is global, and they're involved in practically every country of the world to push this utilitarian mentality that only certain groups of people have the right to reproduce, okay? Yeah. So it really is uh, a, an Aryan-like mentality that not all humans are equal. <laughs> it's a eugenics mentality, basically. It is. It is a eugenics mentality. It is there. And they do, they, some clinics do some other work for women, okay? and women's uh, reproductive uh, health and so forth, but it's minimal. It's so mostly it's about, about, it's, it's, it's mostly there about abortion. There are over 600 Planned Parenthood clinics in this country. Yes. Less than 1% of them do abortion. More, so, yeah, I mean, you can't say most of them. Pardon? 1% of the clinics. Is you, or can, you, can you get an abortion at a Planned Parenthood clinic? 1% out of 600. There's over 600 clinics, Planned Parenthood clinics across the country. I'm, I'm going to I'm going to no, challenge that statistic. But the thing is, the thing is that they will do this all because they're working. Right. 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 You know, all over there, like I said, over 600 clinics my in the United States. My understanding last time on her body is that it's precisely because some states won't grant the abortion license only to specific clinics. And I know there are, there are states that have only one of the clinics authorized to abortion. But it's not because they don't want to do abortion. And only, they want only 1% of them to do There are state it's restrictions. They only get the authorization in one institution. If they could get it, Authorization for 100 percent, they will get it because it's, it's a flat. And I know there's a state, I don't know if it's Illinois or uh, just south of it, that people mm -hmm. have to just cross the state boundary. Oh, yeah, to, that happens in many states. Several, right. Because in the other states, it's only exactly. one or two. So they put them close to the border. Really want to drive them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't know. Yeah, for example, one of the restrictions, one of the, one of the restrictions, and they're all medical restrictions, for example, that the, the abortion doctor should have rights, uh, what are called privileges, visiting rights, at the nearest hospital, for example. Because if he botches an abortion, he cannot finish it, and the woman will bleed to death. Okay, so well, it's yeah. a health thing so that, sorry, let me finish, so and that that woman will be rushed. So let, me, let, me, let me finish this. Let me finish this up. Thank you. So that that woman now, because she's bleeding to death, will be rushed to the nearest hospital emergency room, and the doctor then can complete what he started, you know, in a, in a setting, in a clinical setting, that will at least attempt to save the life of the mother, all right? Never mind uh, the fetus now. And so that is a logical thing, that is a medical thing that is for the woman. It's, it's a clinical uh, requirement for the woman. Another one also, since she's making a medical decision, you know, to have a, a surgical procedure or a clinical procedure, she should have informed consent, right? So informed consent means that she should know the data. 
And part of the data is know the, the gestational age. So they do the sonogram, but they don't show the sonogram to the woman because the woman may tend to bond with uh, the unborn, okay? And so that is denying medical information that she needs to make that, uh, that decision. So those are the types of restriction, if you will, that are being placed on some of these clinics, and that's why they cannot have infected abortion because okay, they, are, they, are, they are restrictions that are trying to help women medically, clinically, to make that decision for her health. Why yes. can't go to the hospital? Why won't the physicians get privileges in hospitals? Since it's a by the board. It's Both of those are uh, issues with the, with the board. If something happened, and they don't, they have a disciplinary action. And, and the hospital, you know, they don't want to mingle with them because of liability. Yeah. Maybe they don't have enough insurance for the lawsuits, who knows? Okay, if you take the state of Louisiana, in this country, yeah. one in six people get their health care from a Catholic institution. In Louisiana, it's one in four. Being traditionally Catholic state, abortion providers are not getting privileged, admitting privileges to a hospital. Despite the fact that abortion is a very safe procedure and that the chances are statistically you are not going to like. Well, let's say for one of the two persons, yeah. yes. Well, Right? Yes, absolutely. It is safe for one or two persons. That's the whole point. It's the highest standards of, uh, and that's all they can be uh, assessed on in the clinics is on their safety of their procedure. Right? But it's safe for one of them for sure. Yeah, that's the whole point. Yeah, absolutely. Safer than a back alley abortion, 100%. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. All right, Shabani, <laughs> please stay with us, okay? <laughs> stay with us. We need to hear. We need to well, hear. I, again, if you can't give me a reason why they, the physicians are not given privileges, it's a political decision. It is not a medical decision. It is well, a that's decision. Your, it's your opinion, but I'm not in there. You're saying that the boards are corrupt. You're saying that the medical boards are corrupt, essentially across the board. They don't give abortionist uh, rights or privileges, right? You're saying they're corrupt. You can't get it. Yeah. Okay, so they're doctors. So if, if they will not be given privileges, admitting privileges, right. it is a political decision. Why is it political? Why is that hurting? It must be something wrong. Because like, if you're doing something right, I would just say, hey, you can do it. Yeah. But then if you're doing something wrong, well, I can give you a perfect example that I know, but it doesn't have anything to do with the abortion issue. It's that yeah. certain cardiologist in Hollywood was not allowed to have privileges at Memorial because the cardiology group didn't want to have them in there. It was a simple matter of economics. So privileges is something that you do, you can be given in vain privileges, and you can withhold them from people yeah. for other reasons. But if you want to say that you want to guarantee the health of a woman and you want to say that you need to have admitting privileges and you need to be able to, to extend the privilege to the care provider, to the doctor, to the OBGYN or the practitioner. And if you say you yeah. can't have them yeah. and therefore you can't have the procedure, then you are saying... Okay. Yeah, right. The practice to maybe has to do with whether a bond, you know, some hospitals make decisions on Medicaid and stuff like that. And no, maybe there's some regulation on a federal level that prevents no, it has to do on the medical having this problem. Part. I think I'm just saying this. If it goes to uh, this reaction with suits against them, um, you know, you can go ahead you know, and just you know, choose a list of 10 doctors that they do abortion, go to the board, and you can find out if they have your issues, and you know. So these are public records. Yeah. yeah it's a public when they, record. when they get a citation or when they get a uh, disciplinary reaction, they are public records because in the best interest. So, right. So you're saying uh, that see, it's a blanket statement, and that's what I have difficulty with is that of the 600 clinics, abortion clinics, and uh, the abortionists, none of them get privileges. You know, so it's this massive discrimination against uh, doctors who do abortions. 
However, my perception from the outside, not being a medical doctor, is that hospital and hospital systems are what they call deep pockets, right? So it would be, to me, it would be a textbook case of David versus Goliath. If these OBGYNs are being discriminated against unjustly, wouldn't you think that they put together a suit or even a class action suit against these hospital systems who are denying them medical privileges unjustly? Wouldn't you think that that would be the case and that we hear about it, about that injustice going on? And yet we don't hear about that, you know? So something is, there must be some truth to that denial, okay? And these boards, I mean, they're super scrutinized by regulatory agencies and the government and so forth. I have a hard time uh, accepting that these boards are all prejudiced against OBGYNs who do abortions just for political reasons or ideological reasons of being anti-abortion, let's say. You know, uh, I really have difficulty believing that that's the case. It may be in a few isolated instances, but certainly not for the 600 clinics, right? Wait a minute, you're talking two different things. I, I'm not sure the argument that you're making that if abortions could be performed in every one of the 600 Planned Parenthood clinics, they would do it. I don't know that. I doubt. I don't either. I don't I either. Don't think so. But at the clinics that do provide the service, mm -hmm. okay, is mm -hmm. one percent of the clinics. Well, that's what I'm saying. The reason for that one percent. I mean, why are you that's stating one percent? What's, what's the purpose of stating one percent? There may be lots of. I mean, I don't know all the reasons. Maybe they don't think right. there's a, a, an economic basis for it. They don't have a provider. That's not what the people do. I mean, right. the fact of the matter is Planned Parenthood's not in the business to do abortions. Okay. Offer, right. full That's what I'm okay. Yeah. Let's say that we have, let's say in a different situation, <laughs> this, this goes into an argument of logical consistency. Again, it has to do with philosophy and ethics. All right. Let's say that we have a particular regime that, uh, 99% of the time executes criminals who have been uh, tried and found guilty of a heinous crime, all right? But 1% of the time, they kill innocent people, all right? They kill innocent people. Can we justify the killing of that innocent person because it's only 1% of the time? If it's just a single innocent human being that is being killed, that is wrong. On purpose. All right. On purpose. Yeah, voluntarily. Right. Killed. Not allowed to die, but killed. So even if it's 1%, if it's 0 0.001% for the sake of that innocent person, that was precisely, that was, what's his name, argument? Uh, pilot. No, it was, uh, I'm sorry, not, not pilot, um, the Jewish. Um, about the Annas and Caiaphas, the two high priests at the time of Jesus. Better than one person died for the people, than the whole population get run over by the Romans, paraphrasing, because we're having a revolt on our hands. And the one person, I hope you all agree, was innocent. <laughs> and, and, and that was Annas, Annas, you know, there it was Annas or Caiaphas, but the two high priests at the time, the two who were running the religious slash political system of the Jewish people at the time. Yeah. That precisely is a utilitarian argument. We're gonna have few innocent die, but the vast majority are guilty. Well, how about those innocent? You know, we hold the state accountable when there is an execution of an innocent man or woman, and then posthumously it was proved, oops, we made a mistake. It turns out that this person was innocent and they got the death penalty. And so we really have to focus on the individual, even if it's just one. The fact is that Planned Parenthood is the largest promoter of abortion in the world, not just the United States, even yeah. if they themselves don't do any. <laughs> you know. Are you saying that because they believe that a woman should have the right, the right to have an abortion? Ability. Yes. Yes. The tools that the the beings, needed to, exactly. to, yes. to live a life, a full, a full reproductive life to control their destiny. So no, no, not control the destiny, Siobhan. We have to be specific. 
because none of us control our destiny. Do you control your destiny? I have no idea what's going to happen in the next minute. The second coming may be upon yeah, I, us. I, I all right? That. Please. To have, to have control over your, your body. Yes. To be able to do that. And yes. That's the goal of Planned Parenthood. And you're saying because they do that and offer a full range of reproductive health services, yes. that they are the largest promoters of abortion? That logic, that doesn't seem to me to okay. be logically do you Do you it's, have control over your own body? Remember Aquinas' thing. Never affirm, Solomon and I, and always distinguish. What do you mean, Professor, by control over my own body? Do you have, I ask you, do you have control over your own body? Yes. I say no. Because some terrorists may be, right now as we speak, may be pouring coronavirus into the uh, AC system, and we have no clue, right? Is that a possibility? I saw a lady walk by just about an hour ago. I think she had a backpack on her back. She looked like one of our students, but I didn't recognize her. Is that a possibility that we could be inhaling coronavirus any time now? Very, very slight, very <laughs> detached, but it is a possibility. You know. In fact, you may have seen the video. You may have seen not the video, the email. Not divulging anything private here. You saw the, the email that came out? Scarlet fever, we have a student with scarlet fever. You're a nurse, we have a student with scarlet fever on, on campus. It just came out. We have now, by mandate, I wonder if the administration would have let this news out if there isn't a mandate from the government to spell out in detail whenever there's an illness or a sexual abuse act on campus. That is, protection, but that is reasonable protection. I don't have absolute control over my body. I have a reasonable control. Uh, on that subject, I, I don't have the words to explain to elaborate my, my humble opinion, maybe we touch on this subject. The abortion issue is a consequence. It's, it's the result of, of the conscious human act most of the time. And At least on the part of the man. Is, I think that <laughs> The main issue here is, is how it originates, you know, sexual intercourse, the decision right. uh, when sex is, is by beneficial in, in the long run for the product, for the human product. Because abortions is unwanted pregnancy. Yes. There's a reason why they are unwanted. Obviously, the, the we can say on the we have to go to the root. Adults, yeah. When that is uh, exactly, and when it's not, yeah. and, and, and that right, we differ on, on that subject. I think that we would never be in the same boat. Sure, considering, abortion. and that's why coming back to contraception, right? Because I'm trying to focus on uh, human sexual intercourse, and I think it's very safe and fair to say that no unwanted pregnancy was sought was sought out. Okay, obviously by definition, an unwanted pregnancy is because the woman did not want to get pregnant, right? So an unwanted pregnancy was not sought out, <laughs> but it may have been imposed on her, which by the way, again, statistically, the vast majority of pregnancies and unwanted pregnancies is by consent. It's not that she was necessarily forced. There is the case of rape and incest, but statistically it's very small, all right? At any rate, that again is a good opportunity. So thank you both for getting me back on track to contraception because what I want to do now is move away from the history as soon as I finish it here with the paper part um, and get into a little anthropology of human sexual intercourse precisely and what makes it human as opposed to just a mere animal act of uh, reproduction, okay? <laughs> So to round this up for a moment, uh, on the counterpart, in 1960, the pill is approved in the US uh, medically, and then it spreads uh, very fast throughout the world, exponentially, it's challenged in court, and eventually uh, the challenge is, uh, is uh, defeated. Uh, Chauvin was the uh, uh, Supreme Court finally decision in 65, you said? I, 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 control um, Griswold 
Uh, I see that person there is the one that allowed birth control for unmarried women. And that was 67, you said? 67. And 65? Is Rudolph versus Connecticut. Okay. That you can, you can use birth control. Married couples could use uh, okay. birth control. After exhausting the challenges. Okay, all right. The 60s. As far as the Catholic Church is concerned, what was happening in the 60s? Aside from all the revolutions, I mean, I'm a product of the 60s. I remember the Beatles, the actual Beatles. Yeah. <laughs> I had long hair. Yeah. <laughs> Vietnam. <laughs> all the social, I remember the unrest here, and people throwing tires on fire on top of the expressway, <laughs> the craziness that we lived in Miami, et cetera, et cetera. 62 to 65, the Second Vatican Council. Church is trying to come up to date in the midst of all the social unrest, okay, to try to be relevant. Uh, Latin was becoming an extinct language. Most people didn't understand Latin. The mass of the world was said in Latin and so forth. So John the 23rd has this idea of convening the council. All right, then he dies. He convenes the council, I think it was like in April, and by the end of the year, he's dead. John the 23rd, okay? Uh, he had a lot of anecdotes about John the 23rd. He was very comical. He had a sense of humor. Uh, they say that he would smoke every now and then when he managed to escape from the Vatican, <laughs> from the papal residence. Uh, one time he was asked, uh, Holy Father, how many people work here in the Vatican? And he said, oh, about half of them. <laughs> <laughs> so he needed a sense of humor because he opened a big kind of worms with Vatican too. But then he died. <laughs> the good Lord said, okay, you've done enough, come up here. Uh, Paul VI takes over. And Paul VI was also very courageous because it's the prerogative of every pope to convene a council or to close a council if a council is open, all right? And he had the courage to bring it to fulfillment. It took him about two and a half years. But in 1965, finally, the, the council closed, all right? And again, if you ask me, I would say that the most important Catholic event in the 20th century was the Second Vatican Council at the universal level. The most important event of the church and we're products of Vatican II. We're all products of Vatican II. We've grown up with it and uh, it was a time of tremendous excitement and like one writer said, it was the best of times and the worst of times. I was born in 52 and I served the Latin Mass as a kid, uh, he could never get it right, the bells would ring at the wrong time because I didn't know the piece, I had no clue, and all of a sudden overnight, I was in Mexico City, my brother and I were out of service, all of a sudden, the priest was talking Espanol, and he's facing us, and finally I could ring the bells at the right time for the first time in my life. <laughs> so, it affected all of us at many different levels, all right? Bottom line. John the 23rd, I'm sorry, Paul VI made a conscious decision not to have the Second Vatican Council sequestered by the contraceptive issue because he saw the writing on the wall. Here he had about 3,000 bishops from all over the world and cardinals who were going to decide about women's reproductive rights, excuse me, <laughs> celibate old men with all pointed hats in, in, in the Vatican, deciding the reproductive fate of women. We can see where that was going, right? So he didn't want the Second Vatican Council to be sequestered by the topic of contraception, which was one, one of many, many other topics that were on the table for, for discussion at Vatican II. So he generated a commission. Actually, uh, John XXIII had started the commission Right? Yeah, I have it. He started with six members, John the 23rd. And Paul VI, when he took it over, he expanded it for inclusiveness to 72 members, also who were late. Finally, the report of the commission comes out in 66, and the majority of the commission gave it the okay. I don't know what the name of the commission? I forget. Um, I forget, but it was a commission. You can look it up. You can just punch in keywords like uh, um, papal commission, contraceptive, uh, Pope, all the six uh, contraceptive commission, something like that. Okay, it will come up. In detail, all the documents are there and the relations because the Vatican in the past few 
years has made a big effort the Vatican Library to try to put all of the Vatican documents and all the church documents online for free in many different languages, okay? And that is partly, actually part of the magisterium. Hmm? All right, so <clears throat> the commission, the majority of the commission said yes to contraception, gave, of course, these are all consultative, uh, consultatory commissions, right? To Paul VI. And then Paul VI went into deep prayer in his own, you know, description, uh, consulted directly with the Holy Spirit somehow, and came to the conclusion that there is something wrong in this decision. In fact, John Rock, being a practicing Catholic, a daily community, and a consultor to that commission, you know, was absolutely convinced in his own mind that the church would accept this was just a clinical method to help women regulate their, their have really the decision to be pregnant or not. You know, so he just saw it as a very positive medical contribution to women and to marriages in determining how many children they want to have and when they want to have them. So after all that discernment, Paul, Paul VI publishes uh, Umane Vitae, which, is, like I mentioned, is the first encyclical after Vatican II on marriage and sexual intercourse and so forth in 68. And that's when he talks about the two dimensions of the marital act, the unitive and the procreative at the same level, not a primary and secondary uh, purpose of marriage or sexual intimacy. He also talks about intrinsic evil. Obviously, he's coming out of a principled uh, ethics or bioethics, that some things are intrinsically evil in themselves, but that for serious reasons, uh, Mm, spacing the children, as is stated in the document, or avoiding conception at a particular time in the marriage would be allowed, would be okay, right? For serious reasons or legitimate reasons, but using natural means. So the means are the issue. Because the very bottom line about contraception is that it causes a, an artificial separation between the unitive and the procreative dimension. So that's why it's important that first part of the encyclical, Mane Vitae, where he establishes these two principles as truly up to par with each other, precisely because the unitive dimension of intercourse is as important as the procreative dimension. He concluded that an artificial separation between those two dimensions is unfair, is inhuman, ultimately. And typically, it is the woman, again, who pays the price for separating, because typically it's the woman who has to then do the contraception, because it is the woman who will get pregnant if she doesn't, all right? So that, from that perspective, it's a, it's a very pro-woman, and it's a feminist encyclical. It is defending the rights of women to not get abused by a contraceptive mentality, which will fall back into having intercourse even when they don't want them because you don't have any consequences now, supposedly. The consequences meaning strictly having a child or not, or getting pregnant or not, okay? So let me stop there. Let's take a break for a moment. And then I want to come back and get a little bit more into the anthropology of human sexual intercourse, okay? Yes, please. Just, um, I just want to be clear, the Papal Commission approved a contraception in 66 and all the six of Humana Vitae. We this were approved. basically yes. reversed it in 68. Yes. Okay, now I know there was a lot of Protestant involvement in Vatican II. A lot of what, I'm sorry? Protestant. Yes, um, because so, it's ecumenical, yes. Right, so did that have any bearing on the approval of the Papal Commission? It was April, maybe not, but... Exactly, no, that's why he created the commission, so that he could uh, exclude this topic from the uh, discussions of the council, all right, from the other topics of the council, because there were many topics that had a worldwide impact that were not specific to this. He didn't think appropriate because at the end of the day, 
the, uh, the, um, the relaciones or the documents that were being drafted and, and talked, discussed, was mostly the bishops and the cardinals of the world, which are all celibate men of majority. There were some Eastern Catholics there who may have been married, but the vast majority were celibate men, okay? So he really wanted to hear from laity, married laity and single laity. And that's why he created the commission. Okay, so I'm still not quite clear. In the commission, mm -hmm. were the Protestant clergy involved, or was it was all Catholic? I don't know. I don't know the okay. exact makeup of the okay. commission. That again is available online, okay. you know. Uh, but I know that it was 72 members um, and it was a broad spectrum of representation there. Yeah. yeah. Yes, of course, of course. Uh, there were heavy discussions uh, that this went on, you know, uh, about three years of discussion went on with these commissions. Okay. The vast majority was a minority, a small minority that dissented from the majority of the mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. One way or another, this is historical because now we're 60 years removed from all this, right? And still today, the pill is the largest contraceptive, but not the only contraceptive. So I want to take up contraception as a whole uh, after the break. Let's make it about uh, five to 10 minutes, please, if possible. So let me stop the recording, where is it? Here. Pause, recording. Here we go. Welcome back. After the break, you'll have a, a little hour to go more or less, just under an hour. Um, okay, yes, Marie, you were commenting just over here. If, uh, Till end of your conversation. I'm not one to judge, and I certainly don't want to judge right. We, at least I have always in my mind the words of Jesus, do not judge and you will not be judged, and so forth. Uh, and yet we have to judge. We have to judge. I mean, the morning I wake up, I'm judging what shoes I'm going to wear, what clothes I'm going to wear, where I'm going to go, but it's the behavior and not the person. Again, yeah, picking up on Aquinas about the distinction thing, we have to distinguish between the person and the person's behavior. Otherwise, we're doomed to chaos. Because think about it. If we do not judge behavior, then the end result of that is that anything goes. If I feel like driving on the left side of the street today, well, who are others to judge me, right? So I should not be judged in conscience but some behavior is right and some behavior is wrong for the benefit of oneself or the benefit of society. So whereas I would say none of us really want to judge, we need to judge, but we need to judge the behavior, the actions, the act itself, and not the person, the agent. Okay, we never pass judgment on the conscience of people. And the one I blame the least really in general is the woman who may be having the abortion because she's having it for a reason, you know. The, 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 the overall distress in her life is such that it takes her to this. Well, but a doctor who has studied embryology and everything else, that's a different story. At any rate, I want to now get into um, a little anthropology, if you will, just a reflection together. I know that several of you are married, so you can draw from that experience also. And the idea is to look at human sexual intercourse as human, as human, right? So I propose to you that human sexual intercourse has an added, <laughs> the added value, all right, has a little extra plus that goes beyond what happens in the rest of nature even at the level of mammals as we are uh, biologically. Because then this would help me to uh, make the argument for or against contraception at, at the end. So re reflect with me for a moment and see if uh, you get to agree uh, with this that Human sexual intercourse is unique, beginning with the physical level, 
but also at the intellectual level and also at the spiritual level, okay? In this sense. Biologically, we're mammals. That means that not only do we have internal fertilization, we also have internal gestation, right? In other words, the pregnancy. Other animals, even though they have fertilization, uh, first of all, the fertilization can be external. And even when the fertilization is internal, in other words, coitus intercourse, as in reptiles, for example, and birds, the gestation, the embryonic stage, is technically outside of the uh, female's body, encased in a shelled egg, all right? But for mammals, we also have internal gestation. So it's an added element, but that we share with all the other animals. And biologically, is to why, why do you think that internal gestation, when it really actually taxes the female that much more, right? It uh, slows down the female, for example. I'm talking about nature in general, mammals in general. If she's being preyed upon by, by a predator, she may have more difficulty escaping. It certainly involves more energy and nutrients that have to go to the embryo, to the fetus, right? There has to be an advantage. There has to be a payback in nature because nature never forgives. It's natural selection. The payback, well, the payback at the level of fertilization is variation, we know that. But gestation itself allows for a greater success of that offspring. So that at the end of the day, when we look at mammals in general, they have fewer offspring. They don't have to, especially the female, doesn't have to involve, um, uh, invest in generating thousands of eggs or hundreds of thousands of eggs, because really at the end of the day, one or a few eggs will do in every cycle to maintain the progeny, to maintain the next generation so that the species continues as a whole. So the payback for internal gestation, which is a tremendous investment in energy, in biological energy, is a higher rate of success in general for the next generation. Number one. Number two, that the embryonic stage, that the developmental stage, the early developmental stage can be extended, protected, protected, right? Whereas um, in uh, fish and reptiles and amphibians and birds and so forth, that gestation stage is not as protected. Eggs, the shelled eggs, are subject to predation, not to mention fish, eggs, and baby embryos are subject to much more predation to the point that the vast majority of those don't make it to adulthood, to reproductive adulthood. Right? Even in those islands, you see a progression towards gestation mm -hmm. in their way. You see a chart mm -hmm. given uh, fly. Oh, yes. You know, mm -hmm. Viviparous. Yes, those yeah. are called viviparous and you see as in, opposed to oviparous. Right. You see them having some of them. Right. Also that. So it, it means that evolution kind of favors. It, seem, it seems to be going in that direction. So there's a selective advantage because we don't want to posit, we have to be very careful not to posit a directiveness in evolution, right? Not directional in that sense, but the, the direction we see it post facto as we look back and we see that there is a gradual tendency toward complexity. And that is undeniable. So there has to be a payback and that is precisely to protect that young one uh, as much as possible. And the maximum protection allowed is literally within the body of the mother. Okay. Uh, in nature, and I'm going to stick with mammals, which are the closest to us uh, biologically, intercourse is only strictly for reproduction. <laughs> In other words, the male only, the female only accepts the male when she's ovulating, it's called estrus, when she's estrus, she will allow herself to be mounted. Um, any other time on the cycle, the female does not allow herself to be mounted, okay? 
And so we can see that it's strictly for the purpose of reproduction. If you will, it's strictly biological business. There's no pleasure involved in it necessarily. Number one, number two, it's also very fast. I mean, if you blink, you miss it. You see birds dancing with each other and courting and so forth, sometimes for minutes or longer. And then if she accepts, boom, the mating is very, very fast. And within a few seconds, it's over. It's amazing, but it's really, truly, uh, typically very fast. It's also a, vulnerable, a very vulnerable moment for the individuals in that species when they're mating, okay? Because all their concentration is on that. And typically in nature, there are always predators lurking somewhere, all right? So when they're concentrating on that intensity of the, of, uh, the population, uh, they're more vulnerable. And so I guess it has developed, just kind of thinking out loud here, so that the actual intercourse is very brief in nature because it's a very vulnerable moment for the individuals involved in that. Okay, so strictly for reproduction. Also, alongside with that, staying with the biological, so I'm still at the physical biological level here, okay? The human intercourse is the only one that is face-to-face, -face. literally prosopon to prosopon, if you will, so to me, that makes it very personal, <laughs> right? Because we're the only ones who copulate that way. The standard in mammals is the mounting from the back end of the female. So that it's not really face to face. And we have to be clear again about the anatomy there, all right, for the other mammals is not anal intercourse when it's occurring because uh, that would simply not happen. The female will not allow herself to, to be penetrated that way. It's just that the female reproductive system is designed so that the copulation is from behind, is from uh, the rear of the animal. So it is not face-to-face, -face. okay? But for us it is. There are other, there is, is a group of mammals where also occurs kind of face to face, but the face is so distorted compared to our face that you can't really call it face to face. Can anyone think of where that might occur? What group of mammals? Kind of face to face, or at least let's say belly to belly, <laughs> if you will. Cetaceans, with the cetaceans, which are the marine mammals like whales and dolphins, they do mate ventral to ventral side, all right? But their faces are actually so, because they have a lot of lateral vision, so their eyes are really kind of pointed sideways and are pointing toward each other. <laughs> they don't have a lot of stereoscopic vision because vision is not really the main sense down there in the water, it's actually sound. And, uh, whereas peripheral vision is more important for uh, alerting to danger. So whereas cetaceans do technically mate or um, copulate ventral side to ventral side, belly to belly. It's not personal in the sense of the human intercourse in the standard classical position of, uh, of uh, human copulation, all right? So this is already pointing towards something that is very personal, even at the physical level, mm -hmm. at the physical level. Now, I want to talk about these two Unitive and procreative dimensions. Sorry, I need to elaborate a little bit more here. Yeah, this gets into the psychological aspect of that human uh, procreation, the human um, intercourse, all right? So, love is a universal call, and we love many people in this world, hopefully. You know, some people may only get to love a few other people. Pity the person who has not experienced love or has no chance to love others, you know. But the type of love that is intimate love is a very particular type, right? This, uh, this sharing this nakedness together is a very particular type of love. Our intuition tells us that it shouldn't really be done <laughs> A lot with many different people. <laughs> it starts degrading, starts losing value. 
But the unitive part, the unitive part speaks to that bonding that occurs with a couple at the psychological level, even before we introduce the spiritual dimension, just at the psychological level, because imagine the investment. And again, typically the investment is, my intuition is that the investment is greater, at least initially, on the woman with the human sexual intercourse. So everybody in that picture knows that she is the one who is risking or accepting getting pregnant, right? Not him. And so it's an investment. Also, even anatomically, you see that it's one who receives, and she receives everything that he brings, but she doesn't really know where he's been before, before her. And he could be a saint, a living saint, and not have been anywhere else before, or not. And he can talk one thing, but have done something else. So you see the risk of the investment for the woman to get into that intimacy, on average in general, at least to my opinion, is much greater on the side of the woman. She's investing more. So it behooves her to make that relationship a lasting relationship, right? I mean, it's even been proved psychologically that the couples who, for example, who are both their first intercourse, that's the one that tends to stick, if you will. That's the one that has the greatest impact on that couple, even if they have other intercourse with other uh, people later in life. That first one is always very special. It's generally, let me say, is very special at the psychological level because there was that emotional, if you will, sentimental investment, all right? Also filled with hopes and expectations of really building a project together, a lifelong project together. Not just a one night stand, for example, or something like that, okay? So the physical intimacy already has implications at the psychological level. It implies, in the best case scenario, a psychological intimacy. So we can talk, it's not just two naked bodies, but it's also two naked hearts, if you will. That vulnerability that occurs between the two of them, they're sharing, hopefully it's not just a fun thing that will be for one night for or X number of days or nights, or whatever they happen to meet. It is personal. There is an investment, there is a sharing of the couple with one another, okay? At least in the plan, we can elucidate a plan of God as he wishes. The, uh, I think it's reasonable to say, to assume that God doesn't want us humans to go around fertilizing. That's precisely why we end up with 7 billion people that God probably didn't want because many of those people came out of human will, but not necessarily God's will. He's looking for stability also for his people and for his couple, all right? So there's the, the, the project, what I call a lifelong commitment uh, of building a life together, all right? A project of life together. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. There are many, many circumstances that go into that original intimacy, how it happens and so forth. Uh, but the fact is that when it does happen, that marks that couple uh, to that there is now in that couple and in, in those individuals a before and an after of that event. Okay? Even before going into the spiritual, just at the psychological level. Why is there that sense of betrayal, that, that deep disillusionment, disappointment, and hurt, deep, deep hurt, when one of the two realizes that he or she has been betrayed, has, that their partner has had intercourse, has had that same type of intimacy with someone else, with a third party, all right? Which again, typically is the man cheating on, on his woman, but it can also be the other way around because we see it now. Okay. When the betrayed, 
person finds out? Why is it generally that deep sense of hurt and disappointment and just anger and disgust? If there hadn't been an investment in that relationship, there wouldn't be that feeling. There wouldn't be that feeling. Okay? So that sense of betrayal is telling us the, the design of nature, if you will, that is meant to be a lifelong commitment. In fact, we see it in some species, monogamy is uh, true, even though for mammals, the standard is actually the harem, <laughs> is polygamy. But a few species uh, are the exception that they do make for life. Anyway, the physical intimacy also is implying when the act is going to be truly and fully human, all right, and not just an animal act, but truly, truly human, that added plus at the psychological level and then even at the spiritual level, at the level of the soul, the conscience. I think we can agree that when these three levels are in harmony, we have what could be a successful marriage, all right? When the couple together make the decisions about their physical intimacy that includes their psychological and their spiritual intimacy. I understand it's an ideal and people may say, Father, with all due respect, you're a Catholic priest of the Roman Rite, which means you're celibate, so what do you know about sex? And I can say, in view of having sex myself, I hear about sex a lot, all the time, and at the end of the day, the priest ends up hearing more about sex than individual couples. <laughs> because the couple hears about their sex and maybe about some friend's sex, okay? But I hear about everybody's sex. And at this point, after three decades, more than three decades of being a priest, I have counsel and hundreds, literally hundreds of couples and individuals before, during, and after the marriage have come to me to talk about their marriage and their intimacy to the point that they tell the priest what they don't tell their spouse, <laughs> okay? And more than once, I've said to, to a person, well, you just told me, please, you take that to the grave like I do, <laughs> because if you want your marriage to survive and thrive, <laughs> take it to the grave, okay? And if he or she finds out eventually, we'll deal with it, you know, we'll cross that bridge when we get to that uh, rapid. <laughs> but for now, if God forgives you, take it to the grave, bury it, and move forward from now on, you know, as Jesus said to the penitent. All right. So we're looking for that bonding that involves the whole person physically, mentally, spiritually, all right? So it's a lifelong project together. I understand it's also a work in progress, just like the priesthood, it's a work in progress, okay? And that's why there are vocations. But at least we have an ideal that we can strive for, mm -hmm. and that is worth fighting for. Also, I consider it intuitive that if that love is going to be a generous love of mutual self-giving and so forth, then naturally there would be a desire for children because it's a natural consequence of average, on average, of that sexual intimacy. Okay? And so there is a longing in their heart, I would say, naturally, for this couple to have children, which kind of um, in a very real sense uh, concretizes their love in this children. And then it's no wonder that parents typically pour so much love into their children because it's kind of an extension of their own love, okay? So it brings in the, the, the other dimension or the other significance, which is the procreative significance. I think that in the end we can say that one way or another, uh, it is a creative activity. It is recreative 
in the unitive aspect that the couple recreate each other literally in their intimacy and in their intercourse and also procreate it. But the root of those two words, recreative and procreative, if is created. And that's where it brings in the spiritual dimension, which is the God dimension. Because if God is who God is, then God has to be creator, right? Initiator, the unmoved mover. So that's where the couple participates in the creative activity of, of God. Again, with or without the children. So their intercourse in itself is already creative and recreative. Okay? Whether the children come or not. Otherwise, we would have to say, well, the couple who is infertile for whatever reason, they should eventually separate because they don't really have a life project together. They should find someone whom they're fertile with, whether it's the problem is on him or her or both. Okay? But no, a married couple, a sacrament of matrimony, at least in the Catholic Church, is valid and licit and has got a blessing, even if they don't have children, okay? So the recreative dimension, which appeals to that unitive significance of the marriage, the bonding between the spouses, is extremely significant, important, and it's one of the two dimensions simultaneously with the procreate, right? So it's participating in the creative activity of God. There's no other activity of humanity that participates so well and so elegantly in creating a new human being. Well, professor, how about cloning and how about this project that is going on in the world scientific community of literally creating a living self from organic and inorganic material to organic material. We'll cover that in the environmental course, the proto beyond, like it's called. You know, how about creating life in the lab? Isn't that a creative activity of the human? Yes, but that is definitely artificial, right? It's not a natural process by the fact that it's occurring in the lab. <laughs> I'm talking about naturally. This is collaborating with the nature that God created because we inherit nature. We did not build our own nature. Okay. And so it's in a very real sense that couple is participating in the creative activity of God. It's allowing God. That's why we say that we are the hands and the feet of God. We are the body of God, if you will, in creating a new individual. And that's how we were all created, really. Okay, God is uh, awaiting for the couple to conceive in order to grant a soul, to grant another soul, individual, personal, indivisible, eternal, etc., like the characteristics of, of the human soul. That makes marriage or, or human sexual intercourse, let's say before the marriage itself, just the human sexual intercourse, something very special, very unique because it engages God one way or another, okay? In that creative activity. All right, so if we move forward from here, we will look at contraception by the very definition, contraception. It is going against conception, all right? So it is truncating. It is intending to separate those two dimensions of human sexual intercourse, the unitive and the procreative dimension, which with a proper anthropology, a full anthropology should be together, should be together. That's what makes the act precisely human and not just an animal mating, all right? So it causes a separation, but it's an artificial separation. In other words, if the couple were not to contracept, that separation would not exist in their intercourse. And that's why um, I'm defining contraception at the level of the intention, because whether the contraception actually works or not, it's a whole different question. 
it's a much more technical question. For example, with the case of breakthrough ovulation and the typical claim, let's say, of the pill of 99% effectiveness or 95%, whatever uh, the manufacturer is claiming. But the fact that it's not 100% <coughs> is telling us that uh, there is a margin of error there. Okay. And that nature has its own plan, if you will, for that intercourse. And nature is so tenacious that it manages to override whether it's the overdose of, uh, of um, or the high dosage of estrogen, whatever it fits on the chemical side. Oh, there are many, many studies, yes. And then, and typically, we're going to talk about the theoretical effectiveness and then the, uh, the actual, which then has to bring in human behavior, right? And but remember, all this is going to be statistical. They're models uh, because they're probabilistic. And that's forever the challenge, part of bioethics uh, challenge, is moving precisely from a probabilistic model to a deterministic model of each one of us, each individual, because we're not probabilities, we're an actual individual human being. So when the manufacturer says this pill is 99% effective or 99.9% .9 effective, I will never know if I'm on the 99% or on the 1% <laughs> as an individual. I may be the 1% that validates the statistic, okay? And so it's always hindsight. And that's one of the challenges forever about going from the probabilistic model to a deterministic model is that transition, you know. But we're literally betting on the odds, right? We bet on the odds. Then we'll move a little more uh, forward. So I'm defining contraception at the level of intention, whether it actually works or not, then many other factors are involved with that, human behavior and even manufacturer, how do we know that that particular batch of the pill or the condom, whatever, they slip, they, they crack, they slide, how do we know that uh, that particular product has integrity? <laughs> you know, again, it's a statistical thing. So the natural default position, for lack of a better word, is a, a desire for choice, a natural desire for choice. But for grave reasons or serious reasons, like Omana Vita says, for serious reasons, it is justified to try to avoid conception, to try to avoid conception, okay? And there are many reasons that are considered serious, and important reasons for avoiding conception at a particular time in their marriage. But they have to be reasons of weight. And this has, it has to do with the conscience and the honesty of the couple. And one thing is uh, that they're both in medical school, in nursing school, and it's taking a lot of time to do all the studies, and so it's not prudent to have children right now, okay? And another thing is that they want to travel to Europe uh, every year for a couple of months. <laughs> There's a different value system going on, right? Uh, so that's why the reasons, which can be many, have to be truly justifiable in their own conscience that these are important, serious reasons. Okay. And that's what Umanevite is saying, essentially, that for serious reasons, conception may be avoided. But then it comes down to the means that are used. Okay. Now, let me fall forward a little bit here. I'm going to focus a little bit on the contraception part now, picking up back on the bio, on the bioethics. Look at some of the clinical aspects. Generally, there are three categories of contraceptives, mechanical, chemical, or surgical, or combinations of these. <coughs> mechanical, the condoms, which by the way, they're also female condoms, you know. They're not as effective either because of anatomy and contour and so forth. 
<coughs> but they also exist. <coughs> the sponges and the caps, diaphragms, <coughs> excuse me, the IUD. Some of these can also, may also cause an abortion, an early abortion as a secondary effect, like I mentioned last time, simply by rendering the uterus inhospitable to the endometrium. And so the embryo fails to implant, all right? So on the chemical side, estrogens and, progester and progestins, typically known as the pill. Then there are also uh, patches and inject injectable dosage that last a week, um, several months, sometimes I've heard to a year. But these in general are chemicals that um, have an impact on the cycle, <coughs> excuse me, on the um, hormonal cycle of, of uh, the woman. And the general purpose is to try to suppress ovulation. On uh, the surgical side, of course, vasectomy on men, the tubal ligation on women, or uh, hysterectomy, which is a more uh, drastic procedure, removing the actual womb. Okay. Um, again, we talk about the surgical procedures. We talk about uh, non-therapeutic sterilization versus therapeutic sterilization. In other words, a uterus that has cancer, ovary, ovarian cancer, and so forth. Then at that point with the surgery, one is addressing a pathology. But non-therapeutic sterilization the, the organ is uh, rendered, is being mutilated precisely because it works, because it's healthy. So there is a, an ethical distinction between therapeutic and non-therapeutic sterilization, even though the procedure itself might be the same thing, uh, surgically or medical. Also, again, going back and forth between the theory and the practice, we know that in principle, a number of these procedures may be reversed, but then in practice, it's a different story. First of all, they are painful. Uh, secondly, it involves uh, cost. Maybe insurance covers it, maybe it doesn't cover it, and discomfort and everything else. And there's never 100% assurance that it will be totally reversible and that fertility is reestablished um, intact. In fact, uh, on both sides, but especially on the woman, on the tubal ligation, uh, we have to be careful because when those tubes are sutured back together, the, the anastomosis that has to be done at the microscopic level may cause some scarring, which will um, uh, impede the passage of the morula or the blastocyst, and then it can cause a pregnancy, a, an ectopic pregnancy, which is a very high risk for, for the mother, all right? So we have to be careful with some of these procedures, again, especially on the, on the woman's <laughs> side, because those organs are delicate and they're supposed to be as smooth as possible for um, first the sperm to get through and secondly, the embryo to go in the opposite direction, okay? Are you saying yep. that Hysterectomies are performed for sterilization purposes? Sometimes in drastic cases, certainly not in the US, okay? But uh, I'm just saying it's a surgical procedure that will cause sterilization or will cause uh, uh, infertility. But not, not in the United States, I don't think it's used, probably not uh, legal <laughs> to do, unless there's a pathology going on. Let me move forward. I already talked about this one. I'm going to concentrate here on uh, the pill specifically, or chemical contraceptives in general, which are variations of the pill, whether it's a patch or, or uh, a high dosage like the um, morning after the liberal gestural. The claim is between 97 to 99%, fine. That implies perfect and consistent use, right? Which is uh, not always uh, human behavior. <laughs> so there's a human factor involved there. Typical use is 91%. 91? 
Okay, so an item. So that leaves a nine percent margin of error. Okay, on human behavior. But again, that's statistically. It's like saying the average, um, the average age um, life expectancy in the United States is like uh, eighty-two for women and seventy-nine for men. So the average average is eighty-one. But none of us have 81% because we're either men or women. So we either fall on the women's average or on the men's average. Okay? And that's the challenge forever with these statistics. How, if I'm taking, if I'm contracepting, am I on the 91% side or am I on the 9% side? I'm just hedging the bet. Okay? All right, so these are some risks and side effects. We know that some of the risks are pretty serious, like clots and cancer and high blood pressure and the psychological level of depression. Side effects, many, some are mild, some are more intense. I'm not gonna go all, over all of them. I do wanna point out that at least from the Catholic perspective, the reason for saying no to contraceptive has nothing to do with the side effects or the risks, okay? Because hypothetically, we could conceive an age in which all of these risks and side effects go away, hypothetically. And then we would say, well, now that there are no risks or side effects, then we would have to say yes to contraceptive. But if it's an intrinsic evil, if the means in themselves are corrupt, bioethically, then no amount of safety is gonna justify it, okay? So I'm just listing these here really for the sake of um, inclusiveness and completion, but also to point out that typically, especially on the pill, zero of this is happening on the man, all right? Zero. <coughs> so again, you see the injustice that I'm trying to point out. It's always on the woman. Hold it. Hold it, may I ask? Hold Give me a minute. Hold, hold it. More comment. Hold on. Um, Please. While, while I agree with this. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Um, hold it. Hold it. Hold it. Uh, question or comment? I was thinking of what you said to me about the intrinsic evil. Mm -hmm. Is that a way to do more on the actual evil? Okay. Again, from a principal bioethics perspective, in, intrinsic evil is that some things are always wrong, no matter how good the end will be. But the action itself is always ethically, morally wrong and never justifiable. Some people might say, let me play the opposition again, like Aquinas does, he puts the part and the counterpart and all this. <clears throat> How can you make such a statement? How can some things be always wrong? Seems kind of radical to me. Well, how about murder? <laughs> Is there any time that murder is justified? It's a question. How many say yes, that murder may be justified in some extreme cases? No, maybe. Okay, how about killing Adolf Hitler? According to the movie anyway, <laughs> I don't know if you saw Valkyrie, Valkyrie. Okay, I think uh, there were about 16, the movie claimed there were about 16 attempts from the SS to kill Hitler, okay? That's why every time he walked into a room of his own people, he would be like a, like a wolf smelling around, where's the next conspiracy <laughs> coming from? Doesn't it apply? Uh, but this on, uh, uh, with his wife, to have the capital punishment legal or not? So, yes, uh, kind of indirectly, yes, capital punishment. But see, but murder, it's all about, I'm not saying killing a person, I'm just talking about murdering a person. Murdering a person implies that that person, the victim, is innocent, right? Now, self defense is killing, but it's not murder. Murder isn't it more a legalistic term? Yeah, it's a legalistic term, but we also understand the fact that some terms are legalistic doesn't mean that no, they're meaningless saying, in society. I think that to be more consistent is the killing of another person. Okay, so let's talk about the fifth commandment. Thou shalt not kill. What if I'm being attacked, you know, 
do I have a right to defend my life? I'm asking us, that's a real question. <laughs> do I have a right yeah, to defend myself? We actually have a responsibility, yes. right? You know, if we don't have a right to, to defend ourselves, then we should justify <laughs> rape because the, the woman should not defend herself, right? What is so there is self-defense and there is defense of the innocent. That's right. Okay. So we extend the principle of self-defense. In fact, the whole theory of a just war, if we've ever had one in history or not, it's a different story. But the whole theory of the doctrine of the just war is an extension of the principle of self-defense at the national level. Exactly. So, so do we? Do we kill that innocent person to save the whole train load of people? Exactly. You see, that's the other thing. We have to be careful when we pose these hypothetical questions that they be realistic, you know. Because uh, Terrorists, they just <laughs> released the virus. <laughs> Should we run too? <laughs> okay, yes. It's very important when we do philosophy that we place scenarios that are realistic, okay? And that are livable because we can place hypothetical scenarios that don't really occur in life, that don't really occur. But we can place plenty of scenarios that do occur. Like for example, the unjust aggressor. The unjust aggressor, I have a right to defend myself. Mm -hmm. and I may forfeit that right and allow the unjust aggressor to kill me. But if I kill the aggressor, I'm not going to be judged uh, as committing murder by the state or by God. So when we see that, that commandment, do not kill, we have to interpret the word kill. You know, it also implies that killing humans, because when I'm eating the tomato, I'm killing the tomato, <laughs> okay? And so on with the cow and the fish that we just ate and the empanada and so forth. So again, it takes a human mind to put some sense into the sentence, thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not kill innocent human beings. We have to finish the phrase. I noticed uh, all Hebrews used to have Different words, so many key terms that we in English, Spanish, mm. we, we tend to put together. Cluster, under yes. Under the same meaning. Yes. And love is one of them. They mm. have like four different kinds of love yeah. and words. And, and even in Greek, philia, agape, eros. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure that the human, they have that distinction. In, it could be. When you kill an animal and it's thou shalt not kill. Right. I think that I heard. Or different words, really? but we're in English, it's always different. Right. And that confuses people. Right. It confuses our hypothetical. I mean, it makes sense, right? It's our intuition. And some people take, uh, I mean, St. Francis of Assisi was a pacifist. It's my opinion that Francis, Pope Francis, is also a pacifist. But that's one position, but it's, it's a voluntary position. Okay. Can't really be imposed on the whole nation. So, um, I forget now why we got into that. <laughs> oh yes, so intrinsic evil, sorry, intrinsic evil. So intrinsic evil is essentially um, an action that is always in and of itself wrong, ethically, morally wrong, all right? And so whereas originally that statement may sound harsh or radical or fanatical, Excuse me, at the end of the day, the Ten Commandments is a good starting list for, for intrinsic evils. In my opinion, yeah. with great difficulty, <laughs> with extreme difficulty, because I also think that uh, most people in society tend to be utilitarian. Just uh, because the principal position just takes more reflection, more effort, more sacrifice, and therefore it's not the it's not the high road. You know. 
utilitarian is kind of the low road. It's the easier way. Just if it's a good end, that's enough for me. Let's move forward. Yeah, truly. Uh, I mean, that's been my experience now after 67 years of being on this planet and seeing what I've seen, not only here, but in several other countries of the world where I've lived. Most people are just trying to get by on a daily basis and they get by, they get by. At times, the corruption is so extensive that it's capillary and it covers the highest levels of government. Officially, not officially, but it's part of the culture for generation after generation. It's very difficult to talk about intrinsic evil. I believe that it's getting intrinsic, it's getting um, increasingly more difficult to talk about intrinsic evil in our contemporary society and especially among our young people today because they just haven't been brought up with the philosophical structures necessary to understand it. Right. Right. The population, yeah, because the clock only moves one way. Yeah, that mentality has taken a toll, and things that you point out, uh, Jorge, are in the encyclical of Paul VI when he was writing this in the 60s, all right? And those several aspects that you mentioned are so prophetic. He mentioned that um, the population, especially in Europe, so I mentioned Europe, but it could lead to a depopulation of the world eventually with contraception. And it also facilitates adultery because there's no seeming uh, consequences. It makes it much easier to cheat on the spouse. And again, typically the cheating is gonna be by the man <laughs> because then he's the one who's having the constant desire, right, on average. And so if she, he's not getting it at home, he's gonna go elsewhere to get it. And if the other person is contracepting, then there's no consequences. So these things do have a social impact. Okay. So uh, these are some of the negative uh, effects of what has become today basically a contraceptive mentality. And if we're honest, I mean, let's be honest, ask around, ask couples, you know. I would say that most of the couples today are not necessarily looking forward to having children. First of all, they're not really married, they're living together, they're cohabiting for as long as it lasts, let's try it for a while. And it's, they're experimenting with each other, they're experimenting with each other's sentiments and emotions. And let's see if it lasts. And if it doesn't last, we just move on to the next relationship. And statistically, what happens is that the more relationship one has, the more relationship one is, tends to have, <laughs> is prone to have, okay? So diversity in this aspect is not necessarily a positive thing <laughs> for the family. We see the disintegration of the family. We see these are all consequences that uh, correlate to the 60s moving forward in an expanding way. We have it right before, before our eyes, under our noses. It's happening right now. Most couples are not having children. They're having pets to the tune that that industry has become a multi-billion dollar industry. But they got only one, and therefore it's increasing. The yeah, because one is kind of a dead end by itself. It's a dead end. I spoke about the, I spoke about the issue in China, was it in this class or another, that I spoke about the, the skewing of the social um, ratio of the man to woman uh, sex ratio in, in China because of the programmatic decision of the totalitarian regime to limit couples to one child. And typically, couples want their firstborn to be a boy. So they were not artificially selecting against women, all right, to get that boy. They discriminate against abortion. Actually, in wars in India, they are protected. Is it really? Uh, even worse, violence. Oh, really? Wow. 
and China. Okay. Even though in the culture they have many children. Um, right. Yeah. But they do select themselves culturally. Culturally. Well, we've seen it in the news, right? This issue of the gang rapes and stuff that is going on. It says it tends to be a very chauvinistic, male dominated uh, society. These are anthropologies that are very, very different from ours. In other words, worldview, views of the human person. What I've heard is that um, the, the son has the responsibility of caring for the parents and their old age. Mm. So uh, no, I'm not sure that is, but that is what okay. I heard. And that's where it stems from. So they introduce the daughter. I see. Uh, so and isn't it a child? Yeah. And isn't it a cultural thing in general that uh, yeah. women, in order to marry, they have to bring a dowry, they have to no. pay into the marriage, right, to be married? Mm -hmm. So they're considered kind of a burden, and they have yeah, to that, pay for. That I mean, not even not so much anymore, but in the past it was... Well, maybe, yeah. So, who pays for that? Uh, I've been to so many weddings. Who pays for that? Uh, the, the rehearsal reception, right? The rehearsal, re isn't it? The, the... The rehearsal is paid by the groom's parents. The groom. And the, the wedding is paid for by the bride. The bride. Yes. Or the general thing, the cultural thing. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> how is it? <laughs> no? no? How is it in Haiti? Who pays for what? Is there a, an ethos? A couple, whoever can pay will pay, uh, will be together. Both families chipping in. Yeah? But the couple themselves, they have to. There's a couple that have to put the party for the people. Yeah. Uh -huh. I see. Okay. Yeah. So many different cultures around this, right? A lot. Okay. Um, so here, yeah, well, here I do the analysis of the ends and the means. Uh, that's what it comes down to with contraception, that we need to justify contraception at both levels of the level of the end. Means. So at the level of the ends in itself may be justifiable, again, for serious reasons, right? The church doesn't expect a couple to have a child every nine months or, or anything like that at all. In fact, the encyclical talks about responsible parenthood, okay? Not planned parenthood, but responsible parenthood, meaning that the, the couple should act responsibly with the number of children that they have. And it's a very personal couple decision. Right, but it should be between the two of them, of course. It takes both of them to raise that child. Um, but at the level of the means themselves, the means are the challenge. Right, that with contraception, whether it's mechanical or chemical or, or surgical, it is inserting an artificial separation between the unitive and the procreative. What is the wrong with? artificiality of it. Okay. We Implied don't, we in don't say we can't fly because that's artificial. Right, exactly. Excellent. I, I like the analogy precisely because we're appealing to nature here. It's unnatural. When we say that something's artificial, then it's not natural. Okay. This has to do with the actual anthropology of these two dimensions. Whereas flying is not a requirement, if you will, for us as humans, we may fly or we may not fly, okay? But the unitive and the procreative are essential to the intercourse for it to be human. You see, it's not, a, it's not an accidental thing that we may either want or not, like the color of the walls of the bedroom or whatever. It's not accidental, it's essential to the act itself, that these two dimensions be maintained together. I use a simple analogy because it's difficult to convey some of these concepts. I look at a coin. How many coins are there in the world? I mean, every country has a range of coins from the penny to the dollar, for example, whatever, all right? Many different kinds of coins in the world. Many, many different kinds, even materials, different alloys, etc. 
But all coins have one characteristic, precisely, which is two faces, all right? Now, we can separate a coin, we can separate the two faces of a coin. We can take a laser beam and split that nickel right down the middle. But in the process, we have thrown violence to the coin. We have destroyed the coin, literally. Okay, so that that coin is no longer valid. <laughs> If we want to maintain the integrity of that coin, those two faces need to stay together. By analogy, that's what I'm trying to say by these two dimensions. I think that the procreative dimension is pretty obvious, that intercourse may lead to having children. You know, any adult who has been around for a few years uh, knows that. So that one, I don't think needs uh, that, follows a natural intuition. Perhaps the one that is more difficult to intuit or to grasp is this unitive dimension. Why does it have to be unitive? Why does human intercourse, in order for it to be truly human, listen to what I'm saying, because I understand I'm presenting philosophical arguments here, but also anthropological, according to our nature, not just mammals, which are strictly for reproduction. But the human act, in other words, the human act of intercourse, to be truly human, needs to have that added dimension, that added engagement of the couple. For example, freely. You know, a lioness, when she's ovulating, when she's estrus, she cannot but lay down and assume the position and allow herself to be mounted by the lion. She cannot voluntarily walk away from the lion if she's ovulating. She has no will, zero will on her being mounted. I hope we agree that women do have the, the right and the natural right and the capacity, the will we will, to say yes or no when they're ovulating, even if their desire biologically is higher because they have more estrogen hit the the, the pressure the senses of the brain, whatever, okay? The libido is higher, psychologically. But she still has the right and the capacity to say no. And that capacity needs to be respected. If we don't accept the unitive dimension of human intercourse, we have to override that capacity because she's already, you know, See, so this unitive dimension is very subtle and so people just don't grasp it. But in my mind, it's absolutely essential to maintain that intercourse to be truly and fully human and not essentially a rape, okay? And when we do that, what does the pill do? Or not just a pill, but uh, any contraceptive. It introduces a separation that is artificial, that is not there so that it renders the woman infertile even when she doesn't want to have intercourse. So now the man uh, can say, well, why are you not giving yourself to me if uh, you can't get pregnant? So what's your excuse now? You know, is it that you don't love me anymore or you just want to be selfish about your body? Why? Because I, as a man, have a desire. I'm just producing testosterone all day long and all night long, and what do I do with that? Do you want me to go elsewhere? Why are you denying yourself to me? You see, it just paints her into a horrible corner. And she just doesn't want to have intercourse. What's wrong with that? Yes. You tell me what's wrong with that. I don't know what's wrong with that. But what husband is going to accept that? Or boyfriend? A husband or a boyfriend that respects the woman's decision. Yes, and only that one. And what's that going to do to the marriage? It's going to separate the sheep from the goats, right? <laughs> in other words, at least in my mind, I don't know. Maybe I'm totally off. But to me, the whole issue of contraceptive paints the woman into having to defend her not wanting to have intercourse. Yeah. Because why is she why does she want to have intercourse? I mean, she doesn't enjoy it. 
What's wrong with enjoying it? If she can't get pregnant anyway, why can't she enjoy it as much as I enjoy it? She can also climax. I can climax. Why not? What's going on here? Aren't we married? And can we make a you know desire to be together, to stay together? So what's the male perception? She's just being selfish. She doesn't want to give herself to me. She may or may have a reason, but I don't see the reason. It just, you see what it paints her? It just puts her in, in a situation, kind of a no-win situation. Again, she's having to explain herself where no explanation should, uh, should be necessary. Let's say, for the sake of argument, the man is, doesn't consider his artificial uh, devices as, as, as a wife for moral or physical reasons. But for the, for the woman, um, maybe the invasive, the intrusive methods are you know, wanted for whatever health reasons the health, or discomfort yeah. or, or whatever. Okay. And let's say that the simplest device, the condom, is being required. Um, and that would be, all of a sudden becomes a condition for having the, you know, the intercourse. Yeah. Because if you don't right. use it, uh, I'm at risk. And if you truly love me, you'll do it. You sacrifice yourself and you use it. Mm -hmm. But for the men, that's anathema. That, that's really bad. Not only because it's, it's, it's a barrier, it doesn't feel the same, because it, it, it breaks the moment. It's completely it's cumbersome. Right? It's, it's not natural. Mm -hmm. it's, it's weird. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Creates a friction in your relationship so great mm -hmm. just to overcome that. Right. It's, it's terrible. Again, this is a personal experience from friends, mm -hmm. from me, from family, right. that would have sexual life. Yeah. And that is an example how on the other side, it, it, it does affect us. Well. And it doesn't help the couple. I would say to the point that some men will say, no, I won't use the condom. Absolutely. And then, you and then the woman has, the, the right? And then she has to decide to stay or not stay because he's not going to use the condom. You know? And I'm thinking out loud here that the counterpart to that is when she says, well, you won't use the condom, I won't use the pill. Where does that leave him? <laughs> you see? If there was no solution to that impasse, I think we'll be in deep trouble <laughs> because I don't think there's nothing more human and as a universal experience as that desire for the intimacy, at least the desire for the intimacy. Thanks be to God, literally, that there is an alternative. And the alternative is simply called natural family planning. It does involve sacrifice, it does involve abstinence, et cetera, et cetera. But Folks, there's a natural alternative, which when used consistently and with proper responsibility and so forth, can be as effective as the artificial contraception. You know, the 99%, whatever you want to claim. Natural learning planning, I'll devote a whole uh, lecture to it and we can uh, chime in then and give your feelings about it or your, your impression. But there is, there is. So, excuse me, invariably we're falling back into nature. <laughs> so allow nature, there's a reason why nature is still around after so many millennia, okay? Nature, there's a wisdom in nature that we can tap into. And we as humans have that capacity, the world we go to tap into the wisdom of nature. In this sense, in the sexual aspect, it's called natural family planning, which brings benefits not just at the physical level of the couple really deciding when they have their children or not, but also at the psychological and spiritual level. So again, an NFP is very positive for what we're calling the unity, uh, the the, um, the unitarian view of the human person. All right, body, mind, and soul together. We need to get there. 
bottom line about this one then is that it introduces that separation, that artificial radical separation with the unitive and the procreative. And again, remember I put it at the level of intention so that the intention is to have the unitive without the procreation. Then if that actually happens or not, depends on other circumstances, but at least the intention is to separate the unitive from the procreative so that we can have the unitive, my couple and I, without the procreative. And that's, the, that's why it becomes intrinsical evil in, intrinsic evil in a, um, a principal ethics uh, analysis. So uh, it really kind of leaves uh, God frustrated in that he had a plan and he created us uh, really whether it's conscious or not, we're not gonna pass judgment again on the conscience. Or really, at least objectively, we can say that it's an act of arrogance. You know, it's like saying to God, yes, thank you, you created us. Fantastic, you created me, fantastic, with your, with, uh, your image within me and so forth. But in this sense, thanks Marie. Watch your hand. You know, God, in this uh, aspect of um, human sexuality, you created us in a certain way and so forth, but we have perfected that now, and we have done it better than you, because now we have contraception, and we have gone beyond your creation, how you created us, with the dynamic of the man and the woman, and now we have, or want to have, absolute control over uh, the number of children that we have and so forth. So really, it excludes God. Again, whether consciously or not, I would say that most couples may not do it consciously, but it really is an attempt to exclude God from that relationship. How so? How, how is God being excluded with a contraceptive mentality? Because I'm seeking to have absolute control on when I create a child or not, or if I create a child. Am I not seeking absolute control when to create a child? If I contracept, right? What is my intention? To avoid conception. But if I contracept, I want to avoid conception absolutely. Otherwise, it's a contradiction in terms. I'm not thinking, when I'm contracepting, I'm not thinking, well, I want to be in the 1% really. You know, I want this contraception to fail <laughs> because I want to have intercourse, I want to have infertile intercourse with my spouse, but I do want her to get pregnant. That's called, there's a word for that. It's called schizophrenia, right? It's not normal. If I'm contracepting, I'm desiring not to create a new child. Well, I, don't, I don't see how you can make a decision between natural planning, which you say is, is perfectly acceptable, because right. it's natural planning and you are deciding the timing and the accidents right. and everything else yes. versus an artificial means. So that seems to be that's not schizophrenic. I mean, if that's not schizophrenic, I, I, I just okay. I don't get it. It's, if you can decide, right. if you have any type of agency over the process, exactly. what is the difference between natural and artificial? Exactly. Exactly. That is an extremely valid question. Uh, we're going to have to hold it until I get to NFP, okay? But then we're going to have a whole class, a whole three hours on why. But it is an extremely valid question. A question, okay, why is NFP not contraceptive? And I'm going to preface it because you said is, um, how is it that you put it at the beginning that is uh, perfectly acceptable? Not really. It's, accept it's only acceptable for serious justifiable reasons. So the end has to be justified still. But here we're at the, the end level of the me. No, 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 the end has to be justified in itself. In other words, if I'm using NFP to avoid children where, whereas I could have children, I'm contraceptive. That is wrong. You know, if I'm, listen to what I'm saying, if I'm using NFP, yes, if I'm using NFP to avoid children, absolutely, you know, without a serious reason, because I want to, because I want to eat caviar, sorry. What happens if you've got a serious reason that ethically bringing a child into this world is the wrong thing to do? That's a serious reason. 
That's a serious reason. But tell me why, you know, because not because it's overpopulated, because some countries are actually going down. We have, we cannot live in the world. We have to live in a particular country. Or we have to live in a particular region of a country. All right. So the fact that the world is overpopulated is not, is not uh, necessarily a reason to avoid having children because that's at the level of the species as a whole. In fact, there are some parts of the world that are depopulated and are going into economic crisis because now everybody's going on social security and pension and where's the youth to work and maintain us because we're all going on pension. It, uh, Europe and the US, if it weren't for the migration, if it weren't for the Hispanic and the Asian migration, the United States will also be a negative population. It's happened in Europe for years now. In some countries of, of uh, Europe, the government pays couples to have children because they don't want them. France, Belgium, a number of them. And they give them all kinds of benefits and health benefits and education benefits. They're begging, the government is begging couples to have children literally because they just don't want children. They don't want children. They just don't want them. And they have truly, they have really followed this idea that we're overpopulated. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It has to be also there's many reasons. One reason that is popular, at least in my circles, is that sense of environmentalism. Uh, we're taxing right. the planet. Uh, taxing the taxing. planet. Taxing. Yeah. More resources that are going to be taken. Uh, uh, kind of like the humans are destroying the planet. Right. But all of a sudden, the, the environment. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's not centered on, on the human itself. All of a sudden, you move the goal to an object and you objectify. I mean, you, you right. make this the, the, the object is subject yeah. of your life, of your goals, of your beliefs. And, and that's the problem. I deal with that every day during my formation and in my that's daily right. life. That's right. And that's what they tell you. But why? Of course, See, these uh, are, they. Yeah. they rationalization is not complete because then they complain about certain things that happen in society because of shift in the culture yeah but but you see in the meantime like Luis, right. how many of those environmentalists okay are willing to go back to the bushes and leave their cars and leave their credit cards and stop flying and go back into nature and yeah. live on fake leaves and how many of them? We will have that discussion in environmental class mm -hmm. because I have a lot to tell yeah. you. Yes, that's a, that's in the meantime, right. Because in the meantime, they're all enjoying their credit cards, right? So it's very easy to be a couch communist. <laughs> yeah, this is the argument that they say, well, in order to preserve the planet, you, sure. Brazil, you, Central America, <laughs> you, Africa, right. you have to remain underdeveloped. You have to remain in the first world. Yeah. I mean, that's the question is resources. get out of poverty, uh, it's not viable. I mean, they will tell you, yeah, 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 but you can become, you know, a leader in society and all these things. It just doesn't happen with the normal mechanism. Because actually, environmental protection is a function of actually um, improve your condition. Yeah, of human development. Developing of human development. And then when you have the resources and just a legal framework is that you start protecting and improving. Well, oh, look at the national park system, system right? The, the, the national park system is an example of that. Right. Where, where laws work and so forth, countries where no work, they can protect large sections of, of, the, uh, of the environment uh, in perpetuity. But it takes that reasoning and it takes uh, presenting the arguments. So, um, again, another difficult, challenging topic, contraception. I presented you the view, at least from the principal perspective, of how it interferes with those two dimensions that make uh, human intimacy, sexual intimacy, human, right? The unitive and the procreative. It may take some more reflection and, and uh, pondering or dialogue, fine. We may pick it up again a little bit. Uh, I need to talk about, do you think this is controversial? When do we get in vitro for this issue? 
So we're just gonna go from hot topic to hot topic here, okay? Uh, in the meantime, it's also an exercise of looking at those existential questions of who we really are, where do we come from, you know, more than just biologically, because genetically we can trace our ancestry and just go to the computer and 23andMe or whatever, but where did we really come from, truly? And where are we going? Are we just heading to the grave? And that's it? Then why all the fuzz? <laughs> okay. So these are existential questions that come up throughout the program. And we each may have an answer, a different answer. Uh, and yet we can think of as a humanity, you know, that we have a collective answer also of where we've come from and why are we here and where are we going? And this is part of it. I see it's already one o'clock. Wow. All right. Thank you again. I'll post this and God willing, we'll meet uh, next Saturday. All right. Saturday after. Yes, still two Saturdays, still two Saturdays, yes. So we're still on for two more Saturdays, then there'll be a break of two Saturdays. All right. Question. Yes. Did we talk no. no so we and a topic pregnancy, now, yes. Right. right. Double effect and a topic pregnancy will come up um, next time. All right. Okay. Thanks again, folks. Uh, let me stop this. And